please be seated. Before the doors open, you'll all have to excuse me a little bit today. I was cheering my son on at hockey. Our daily routine, routine, presenting and reading petitions, presenting reports of committee. I recognize the Honourable Minister of, or yeah, Minister of Justice. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee on Law Amendments, I'm directed to report that the committee has met and considered the following bills. Bill number 419, an act respecting certain financial and other government measures. The committee recommends the bill to be favorable consideration of the House with, with certain amendments. The report is tabled. <laughs> Um, yeah. Ordered, <clears throat> ordered that this bill be re referred to the Committee of a Whole Host on Bills. Tabling reports, regulations, and other papers. Statements by ministers. <laughs> Government's notice of motion. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas endometriosis is a complex and debilitating chronic disease that occurs when tissue that is like the lining of the uterus implants outside of the uterus to form painful lesions, cysts, and deep nodules, and whereas it is one of the most common gynecological diseases affecting 1 in 10 Canadian women with primary symptoms including abdominal pain and infertility, and whereas there is no definitive cause or known, known cure for endometriosis. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of the Chamber recognize March as Endometriosis Awareness Month and thank the advocates and medical professionals who work so hard to provide care for all those who are suffering from the disease. Speaker, I ask for a waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for a waiver. Is it agreed? Agreed. <clears throat> it is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye? Aye. Contrary mind it nay? The motion is carried. Introduction of bills. I recognize the honorable member of, for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to rise on a point of order. Please go on. Thank you. Madam Speaker, on Friday, it was difficult to hear the conversation uh, during question period, so it wasn't until after question period um, when I was able to review the transcript or review Hansard that I noticed that the Minister of Health, uh, during debate on um, personal health files being released, that uh, she referred to that I was f trying to fearmonger and scare people. And I'm wondering if the, if the Speaker can rule if that is unparliamentary or not. We will take that under advisement and review the transcript. Thank you. Uh, notices of motion. No. Statements by, statements by members. I recognize the honourable member of Richmond. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, today I would like to recognize the St. Peter's and District Volunteer Fire Department and Ladies Auxiliary. This past October, they celebrated their 60th and 40th anniversaries, respectively. The volunteers held an open house that was well attended by members of the community of all ages. They also held a dinner and awards banquet where many long-term service awards and medals were presented. Adam King was honoured as Volunteer Firefighter of the Year. The Fire Department and Ladies Auxiliary are both very active in our community. The Fire Department holds a Cram the Cruiser event every December to support the local food bank. The Ladies Auxiliary holds a Christmas craft market every November that not only provides a place for local crafters and bakers to promote their products, but is also a large fundraiser for the Fire Department. This past November was the 40th anniversary of the market. 
Madam Speaker, please join me in congratulating the St. Peter's and District Volunteer Fire Department and Ladies Auxiliary and wish them all the continued success. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for King South. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize Hugh Chipman of Wolfville, also known as Junior Woodchuck Huey in the worldwide outdoor recreational activity of geocaching. Geocachers explore the world using a GPS to hide and find hidden cache containers revealing interesting and special places around us. Junior Woodchuck Huey has hidden 410 caches to date, making him one of the most active cache hiders in the country. Many of his cache containers take hours to build and have been awarded 3,962 favorite points from his fellow cachers. Junior Woodchuck Huey also creates many challenging puzzle caches, stretching the minds of many a cacher. Junior Woodchuck Huey has also organized the annual Geocaching Film Festival in Wolfville and held geocaching events bringing together geocachers to learn puzzle-solving techniques. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in thanking Hugh Chipman, a.k.a. Junior Woodchuck Huey, for his many creative contributions to the geocaching community in our province. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Madam Speaker, I'd like to stand today to thank the great growers in Nova Scotia and the wine producers in Nova Scotia for all of the hard work and amazing work you do to provide the best wines in the country. Your voices have been heard, your emails, calls, roundtable discussions, meetings and mobilizing have been a catalyst for change. True discussion. The Nova Scotia farm wine sector is vibrant and growing. You have put Nova Scotia on the map as a premier travel destination, supporting rural communities throughout Nova Scotia, coast to coast. I think I would like to thank all the folks that all you do. Uh, excuse me. I would like to thank all the folks for all that you continue to do for the wine sector, and. I would like all the members of this house to join me on a wine tour when the weather gets nicer uh, to have a good time because I'm pretty sure we will all enjoy ourselves in the wineries. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Communications, Nova Scotia Addictions and Mental Health. Nope, wrong. Madam Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge the actions of a group of firefighters who endured incredibly harsh conditions in fighting a blaze at an apartment building during the record snowstorm in early February in Cape Breton. A young family of five who had only been in Cape Breton for five months called 911 after waking up to an electrical fire in the ceiling of a two-story apartment building. Within minutes, the flames spread throughout the building. Firefighters carrying over 50 kilograms of equipment, over 150 meters and waist-high snow quickly arrived at the scene. CBRM snowplows were called in to clear a path during the height of the storm to allow firefighters to run their water hoses down the street. Platoon Chief and now Fire Chief Mark Benton said, quote, it was without question the most difficult conditions I've operated during my career as a firefighter and as a paramedic. <clears throat> Thankfully, no one was injured in the blaze and the firefighters were able to recover the residents' important visas and travel documents. Great work to all these first responders and thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Annapolis. I am pleased to rise today to celebrate Town of Annapolis Royal Town Crier, Christine Ego. Christine recently received international attention after being featured in the UK-based Guardian newspaper series, A New Start After 60, which presents stories from people who pursued passions later in life. When the town announced it would be holding a cry-off to select a replacement for the former town crier, Christine was retired, grieving her mother, who recently passed away, and was looking for a way to give back and spread positivity throughout her community. Her husband convinced her to throw her hat into the ring, and in the spring of 2022, at the age of 60, Christine impressed the judges and won the privilege of becoming the first female town crier in Annapolis Royals history. Since then, the retired French teacher has been an exceptional ambassador for our community by welcoming visitors, attending ceremonies, and delivering dozens of proclamations. I invite all members of the House of Assembly to join me in congratulating Christine on having her story featured in The Guardian and thanking her for all she does for our community. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Madam Speaker, I rise today to celebrate my excellent friend, Alexander Thomas McLean. Born in Montreal, he grew up in Dartmouth. He was a high school poet and a great artist from an early age. 
We met at King's in the 1990s. We hung out and did theater there. And then in 1999, we joined Zupa Circus Theater together. With Zupa, we created nine shows, him as director, me as an actor, touring around Canada, the US, and the UK. He continues to be our co-artistic director at Zupa and has helmed several more incredible productions. He also co-created my favorite play of all time, Icaria, in which he gave a shocking and beautiful performance as Thomas, a boy who wanted to fly. Alex is generous, smart, funny, and demanding of himself and his colleagues. He loves to eat good food, watch good movies, and quote good poetry. He is interested in everyone and by many things, and he is a super great dad. Madam Speaker, a minute can't do him justice. Alex McLean is one of the best, and he's turning 50 on April 1st. No fooling. I ask all members of this house to join me in wishing him a very happy birthday and many more years of happiness and creative excellence to come. I recognize the honorable, honorable member for Waverly, Fall River, and Beaver Bank. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize the Fall River Garden Club. Each year, they hold a successful plant sale, providing residents with beautiful plants for the price of a donation. In November, after years of planning and working with local metal artist Heather Laurie, the Garden Club unveiled an incredible monarch butterfly sculpture in Jamison Park on Fall River Road. This butterfly sculpture serves as a reminder to plant more milkweed for the monarch butterfly species, especially in the fall. The seeds need to freeze to signal them to germinate. Madam Speaker, please join me in applauding this small but mighty garden club in Fall River that is truly taking flight in our community. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honourable member for Sydney, member two. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. What a week it was in Sydney. Uh, I rise in my place today uh, as one of the Cape Breton MLAs to congratulate uh, the island on a very successful World Women's Curling Championship, and rise in my place to recognize uh, Team Canada for winning the gold here in Nova Scotia. <laughs> To Team Holman and her team, congratulations. Thank you for everything uh, that you uh, bring to the sport of curling, uh, not uh, representing our country. And I do want to rise my place and recognize the hundreds of uh, volunteers that were involved with the event. CBRM put a ton of work into this bid. We had the Scotties before. This was the next step. Uh, we had thousands of people uh, attend the curling. That was one of the big talks, is that these were some of the biggest numbers ever for a curling event. Uh, to see Centre 200 sold out uh, and how electric it was uh, for the championships yesterday was, uh, it was amazing. It was amazing for our community. So I rise in my place, uh, congratulate Team Canada, but, but uh, also so congratulate the CBRM and so many staff and volunteers who made the World Women's Curling Championship such a huge success. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honourable member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pierre. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to recognize Noah Hefferman. In, in April 2018, Noah Heffernan participated in his first boxing match at eight years old. This weekend, at the age of 14, Noah won gold at the Canadian Cup in Calgary. Mm. On Friday, March 29th, from 7 to 9 at the New Waterford Boxing Club, the New Waterford Boxing Club will be hosting a congratulatory open house for Noah. Congratulations, Noah. You've made your community very proud. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Argyle. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize the great work of the Argyle Municipality Historical and Genealogical Society. The Society works hard to fulfill its mandate and mission to preserve, protect, promote and make available to the public Canada's oldest standing courthouse, the Argyle Township Courthouse, as a historic site. Located in the centre of Tusket, the building was completed in 1805 with its first court session held in October of that year. The most well-known trial to take place in the courthouse was the murder trial of Omar Roberts in 1922. One of the Society's most significant actions was, to, was the establishment of a quarterly newsletter, the Argus, consists of approximately 45 pages with uh, about one half being devoted to historical and genealogical articles about our communities and people. Madam Speaker, I ask all members of the House to join me in thanking the Society for its work in the preservation of Argyle's unique heritage. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to recognize Jason Billard, resident of Beachville, Nova Scotia. Born and raised in Newfoundland, Jason came to Halifax to make a life for himself and succeeded. He was diagnosed with ALS in January 2023, and his family and his friends immediately decided to use this as an opportunity to raise funds and awareness. This year also marks the 10th anniversary of the Ice Bucket Challenge. 
which dramatically accelerated the fight against ALS. Jason's birthday is coming up on April 6, and he will turn 52. I'd like the host to join me in wishing Jason a very happy birthday and send our best wishes to Jason, his wife, Patty, and the rest of the family and friends on their journey with ALS. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to make an introduction. Please do. Um, joining us in the West Gallery today um, is Michelle Hubert and Elliot Boyd. <laughs> Welcome, and we all hope you enjoy your time here. I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Madam Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Michelle Hubert on the publication of her first work of fiction. Coming in May 2024, Every Little Thing She Does Is Magic is a story about a young woman coming of age in a family that believes it's cursed. The story is woven around a mixtape of 80 songs and a tarot spread. Yeah. Published by Nimbus Publishing and Vagrant Press, it's a darkly humorous <laughs> and heartwarming story of grief, love, magic, mothers and daughters, and the things that haunt families for generations. It's been described as the perfect trip back to 1980s Nova Scotia. Michelle previously published Enriched by Catastrophe, Social Work and Social Conflict after the Halifax Explosion that looked at the lessons learned by social workers in rebuilding the lives of Haligonians. Michelle is just completing her Master's of Fine Arts at King's and already has a second uh, nonfiction publication on the way. I can't, read, I can't wait to read every little thing she does as magic, Madam Speaker, and I ask all members to join me congratulating Michelle on the release of her first book of fiction. I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Atlantic. Uh, Madam Speaker, as we head into spring and hopefully the warmer, drier weather, uh, I want to take a moment to recognize all firefighters in Nova Scotia. In particular, uh, I would like to recognize the firefighters at Station 6 in Spryfield, Station 62 in Williamswood, and Station 60 in Herring Cove. They not only keep us safe, but they are the first to volunteer at community events, and they always put people first. If you see a firefighter, Madam Speaker, stop and thank them. They truly are community heroes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honourable member for Bedford Basin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Bedford lost a significant member of our community in February. David Conley was a longtime educator in Bedford, spending most of his 40-year career right in the community. He started by teaching phys ed and later transitioned into the classroom and eventually administration. And then in the latter part of his career, David chose to return to the classroom. He taught generations of children in Bedford, and Mr. Conley was a teacher they remember. David recognized the unique qualities in every child and believed in their potential. He had a positive impact on many young lives. And in addition to his career in education, David owned his own consulting business. He also coordinated the summer camps at Bedford Academy. He coached basketball for many years and volunteered with the Beavers swim team and with Scott Manor House, Bedford's Historical Society. My condolences go out to his entire family, his soulmate Nancy Wallace, daughter Samantha, grandson Nash, and brother Kevin. David was only 68 and he was one of those people who was part of everything. I still find it hard to believe he won't be at the next big event. He will be missed. I recognize the honourable member for Halifax, Shibakto. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to recall with particular appreciation a compelling concert that was held on the 1st and 2nd of December at St. Matthew's United Church in Halifax. Celebrations, a concert in support of the Halifax Workers' Action Centre, featured Polaris, the core choir of Choirs for Change, and explored themes of labour and rest through the work of such contemporary choral composers as Rosafania Powell, Eric Whitaker, Nicholas Kelly, and Tracy Wong, with choral arrangements of musicians Aurora and Dolly Parton. Polaris was joined by Hammer and Seashell, a Halifax duo who specialize in songs of solidarity and struggle. The concert brought together two organizations with amazing missions. Polaris, a community choir of singers with a commitment to social change and social justice, and the Halifax Workers' Action Center, who provide free employment law information, advocacy, and education with a defining commitment to improving the lives and working conditions of low-wage and marginalized workers. The energy provided by this overlay was palpable and progressive, and it was a real privilege to take the evening in. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honorable member for Anaganish. 
Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize Adam Partridge from Anaganish. On the night of February 3rd, northeastern Nova Scotia experienced an extreme snowstorm. Two snowmobilers in the Arisag area became trapped while out on the trails. Four Valleys Fire Department, Search and Rescue, RCMP and local residents commenced a search to locate the pair of snowmobilers. Adam was eager to help with the searchers with his excavator. As the weather conditions deteriorated, Adam was warned not to continue up the trail for his own safety. He did, however, continue, digging at least five kilometres through snow that was almost up to the windows of his cab. The snowmobilers were in a makeshift shelter when they heard Adam's excavator. They were about 20 to 30 feet off the trail, and one of them was able to wave Adam down. <coughs> Fortunately, Adam was able to get them to his machine and eventually to safety. Adam was aided by members of the community who provided gas for his machine and helped keep the road open. Madam Speaker, I ask all members of this House to thank Adam for his bravery, as well as all those involved for rescuing the snowmobilers. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Fairview, Clayton Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize Heidi Mass, the owner and instructor of Can Play Piano, located in the heart of Fairview Clayton Park. Heidi's belief in the innate musicality of every individual drives her mission to spread the joy of music far and wide. Born and raised in Halifax, Heidi's connection to music has shaped her life from an early age. She extends her passion to others using the revolutionary Simply Music Piano Learning Method, allowing students of all ages and skill levels to discover and develop their musical abilities in a supportive and enjoyable manner. Whether you're a complete novice or seeking to reignite your, pa your musical passion, Heidi welcomes you with open arms, with both in-person and online lessons available. Students have the flexibility to learn at their own pace and convenience. Madam Speaker, I invite all members to join me in recognizing Heidi Mass and Can Play Piano for enriching the lives of her students and inspiring a lifelong love of music. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today I rise to honour Mr. Scott Frazier. After Hurricane Dorian, Scott Frazier and his co-workers from Nova Scotia Power worked tirelessly to restore power to homes throughout Cumberland County. In the early morning of Sunday, September the 15th, 2019, Scott Frazier contacted me through Facebook Messenger. He and his team had a large amount of food and Scott didn't want to see it go to waste. He wanted to know if there was anyone in need that they could give the food to. Within the hour, we met and Scott gave me boxes of apples and oranges, a hundred of breakfast sandwiches and hash browns, coffee and more. The food was delivered to some very grateful people and many hearts were encouraged that day. Scott Frazier has a heart of gold and today we acknowledge and thank him for his kindness, goodness and giving spirit. Scott is dealing with a serious illness and I want everyone to know what an incredible man he is. Please join me in thanking him and recognizing his giving and kind heart, as well as all the years of work he completed within our community for Nova Scotia Power, serving to keep the lights on. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Britain Centre, Whitney Pier. Thank you, Speaker. I rise to recognize Colbal, a national basketball tournament held at Breton Education mm -hmm. Centre. This week-long event is not just about basketball. The participating students from schools across Canada join in school-sponsored educational, social, and cultural activities. In this tournament, you come as a stranger, you leave as a friend. Speaker, Cobol Board of Directors work hard planning and organizing this fantastic week. The volunteers are bar none. It is truly a fun and communal experience for all. This year, Cobol was delayed due to 200 centimeters of snow. Next week, the annual tournament will be held at Beck. I want to welcome all players, coaches, and family to our community. This Cobol year is really one for the books. Thank you. I recognize the honorable member for Eastern Shore. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to bring recognition to the Eastern Shore Forest Watch Association. This year, the association is celebrating their 25th anniversary of environmental stewardship. The Eastern Shore Forest Watch Association has been involved in many advocacy campaigns over the years, including the designation of Ship Harbor Long Lake Wilderness Area and the protection of Owl's Head Provincial Park. Recently, the Eastern Shore Forest Watch Association hosted an all-ages special event at the Deanery Project in Lower Ship Harbor. The day included a trail run, workshops, forestry demonstrations and displays, eco-art and puppetry activities, live music and performances, as well as a free tree giveaway. I ask all members of the Assembly to join me in congratulating the dedicated volunteers on their silver anniversary 
and for their continued education and action in supporting the long-term health of the Acadian forest ecosystem. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Bedford South. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As we all know, tax season is upon us. Each year, the CRA puts on the Community Volunteer Income Tax Program, a great opportunity for people with simple tax returns to get their taxes done stress-free. I'm happy to say that, once again, this year, my constituency office is accepting returns as part of the CVITP. I particularly want to thank constituent Fox Liu, who has recruited dozens of volunteers to help administer this year's program. My constituency assistant, Joanne, tells me we have had a great response so far this year, and we continue to accept returns until the end of April. Thank you to everyone who is helping make tax season this year easy and, dare I say, fun. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honorable member for Halifax Needham. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize Ryan Veltmeyer, a community developer, entrepreneur, and a musician. Ryan has 20 years of experience in all of these facets, using a collaborative cross-sector approach to build communities through youth and arts engagement. Ryan believes in the power of creativity and innovation to activate human potential and create economic and social prosperity in communities. Co-founder of the Youth Art Connection in 2012, a charity building communities of young creatives through workshops, community hubs, festivals, public forums, and leadership development. Ryan embodies all of this in his work daily, and I am grateful for our many conversations and interactions while working with youth in our communities. I would like all members of this House to join me in recognizing Ryan Veltmeyer for his steadfast dedication to youth and community. Keep up the great work. I recognize the Honourable Member for Kings North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize and acknowledge Nancy Wales, Operations Manager of the Funding Interchurch Food Bank in Kentville. Nancy is a caring and thoughtful volunteer who bakes weekly treats for her volunteers and donate, who donate their time and energy at the Funday Interchurch Food Bank. Whether it is muffins or scones, the baked treats are a wonderful way to thank our volunteers for the many hours of physically demanding work required at the food bank. The volunteer team at the Funday Interchurch Food Bank in Kentville includes veterans, retired teachers, clergy, law enforcement professionals, and others who serve the communities of Kentville, New Minas, Colebrook, and surrounding areas. Please join me today to recognize and acknowledge Nancy Wales as a leader in volunteerism in our community. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to acknowledge that March is Pharmacy Appreciation Month. I'd like to acknowledge all the hardworking pharmacists and their team around the province. And on behalf of the community of Hammonds Plains, Lucasville, I'd like to recognize the Kingswood Pharmacy, Brookline Pharmacy, Sobeys Pharmacy, Tantown, and Medicine Shop Pharmacy in Tantown as well. And I have a little soft spot for my former neighbors, so I'd like to recognize uh, the team at Hammonds Plains Pharma Choice, pharmacists Allison Anderson, Vanessa Banwa, Kristen Bergman, Matt Nowick, Brittany Patchequin, Registered Tech, Carrie Ketty, pharmacy assistants Amanda Noonan, Aaron Griffin, Jackie Frazier, Anna McKenzie, and Melissa Craig, and I uh, will encourage all members of the House to say thank you to a pharmacists or all the pharmacies out in your constituencies and parts of our province, and wish them a happy Appreciation Month as they continue to do their work. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax, Citadel, Sable Island. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize the career and contributions of Patrick Lunderkin. Sending our children out in the, into the world can be unnerving for both parents and children. It always helps when the child's community is providing collective support and safety. School crossing guards provide an important connection between home, community, and school. <laughs> for over 40 years, Patrick Lundergan worked as a crossing guard at Lamarchant St. Thomas School before retiring just a couple of weeks ago. Pat is a devoted partner and father. He continued his devotion to children by spending his days helping students safely cross the street on Roby Street and more recently at La Marchant. As one parent said, we need more Pats in this world. Madam Speaker, I ask all members to join me in recognizing the vital role of school crossing guards and in particular to thank Patrick Lunderkin for years of service keeping children safe. I recognize the Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'm very pleased to rise today 
to recognize a great friend who was raised in our small village of Big Bador. His voice has been heard over the years at various radio stations, both in Cape Breton and here in Metro, and he's currently the afternoon host at Hot Country 103.5. It's also the voice heard every at every Halifax Mooseheads game since 1994. That's 30 years for Ian Robinson. Ian got to start at a small station while attending Memorial High School in Sydney Mines, where you say he got the bug. Ian began his professional career in broadcasting working with another resident of Big Bador, Dave Reynolds, at CJCB and CHER Radio in Sydney. And it was onward and upward ever since. His experience as the announcer for the Mooseheads has also led him to write a book entitled Ultimate Hockey Joke Book, Laugh Your Face Off. I ask all members to recognize Ian Robinson for his tremendous success and wish him the very best in the future. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honorable Member for Cole Harbour, Dartmouth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today I stand to recognize Bob Martin, a longtime resident of Cole Harbour. Bob spent his professional career working in the banking industry while giving generously of his time outside of work to coaching minor hockey in Cole Harbour for over 35 years, as well as on ice refereeing the game that he loved. After his first retirement, Bob was keen to jump on the tourism bus where for 31 years he would guide visitors to our province on daily trips to Lunenburg and Mahone Bay. Bob took great pride in his work with tourism and felt somewhat an ambassador, promoting the beauty of our province and all that it has to offer. Bob is a proud Nova Scotian, and I ask the members of the House of Assembly to join me in thanking Bob Martin for a lifetime of contributions to our province. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize the efforts of Rod Gilroy and the many volunteers who organized the 8th Annual Wild Game Dinner in the community of Tidnish. The dinner has become an annual event, along with many others, facilitated by the Tidnish Crossroads Community Association. The Community Association is a group of very dedicated volunteers who are united in support of local initiatives and activities. Throughout the year, people in the area have the opportunity to participate in events that enhance the overall well-being of residents of all ages. In the spirit of service that defines Cumberland North, it is not surprising that there are plenty of volunteers whose hard work and selfless contributions benefit the Tidnish area. One of their greatest achievements is maintaining the Tidnish Crossroads Community Centre, the gathering hub of the area. With Mr. Rod Gilroy's leadership, alongside the dedication of numerous volunteers, the Wild Game Dinner is just one example of what's happening in Tid Tidnish if you're in the area in July. Thank you to Rod Gilroy and all the volunteers for their invaluable efforts. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I ask before we move on that all members um, uh, keep their statements to exactly a minute. I notice that there's a little bit of a, a thing that goes on with, with some, so please, minute. I recognize the Honourable Member for Colchester North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize Team McIsaac, a group of ex exceptional young men. Madam Speaker, last Friday, Team McIsaac left the Halifax Airport on the way to Fort McMurray, where they will represent Nova Scotia in the Canadian Under-21 Men's Curling Championships. Madam Speaker, last month, curling out of the Truro Curling Club, they went undefeated to win the Nova Scotia Championship. And although this team uh, competes in the tw Under-21 division, they have curled together since they were youth and have, many, many, uh, have a long history of accomplishments. To mention just one, last year, they represented Nova Scotia at the Canadian Winter Games not only did they go undefeated, but they never trailed at any time during that tournament. Madam Speaker, Team McIsaac will represent Nova Scotia well. They are mature beyond their years, hardworking and extremely committed to their sport. I fully expect them to be the next Team Gushu. Madam Speaker, I ask that this House wish Skip Caleb McIsaac of Greenfield, third Nathan Gray of Dark, but second Owen Fisher of North River and Colchester County, Christopher McCurdy of Old Barnes and Coach Craig Burgess of, of Hilden, the greatest of success, they will proudly present, represent Nova Scotia. I recognize, I recognize the Honourable Member of Clayton Park West. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize an outstanding constituent of Clayton Park West. 
Oksana Najina. Oksana first contacted my office in regards to her concerns over a school bus stop on Wentworth Drive in Rockingham South area. And she wanted to advocate for a crosswalk to be installed. Working with our local councillor, Catherine Morris, I visited the site and concurred that it would be a safety risk for our children cross <coughs> sorry, crossing the road. <coughs> Excuse me, I don't know where that came from. Our thanks to our councillor, Catherine Morris, who got the HRM staff to investigate and a, and a crosswalk was installed within a few weeks. It's citizens like Oksana who make, a riding, who make my riding of Clayton Park West a safer place to live. I ask the House to join me to express our gratitude to citizens like Oksana Nigina who contribute to the safety of our neighborhood. And thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Madam Speaker, I rise today with great pleasure in uh, congratulating Alan Maxine Clark of Oxford. Al and Maxine are beloved trail stewards of the Bunny Trail and have given countless hours of hard work and dedication, keeping the trail safe and enjoyable, helping folks access nature. Al and Maxine were the recipient of a Built Environment Award as part of Recreation Nova Scotia Awards for their work on this trail. Please join me in congratulating Maxine and Al on the receiving of the prestigious award and thank them for the dedication to the trail. We in Cumberland South are extremely proud of them and thankful for their commitment to this trail. And yes, Maxine, I owe you a trip on the trail once this legislature rises. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I recognize the honorable member for Clare. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize the invaluable contributions of Jacques Deveau in France to the community of Clare. Along with Marguerite Leblanc, Cindy Leblanc, and Désiré Leblanc, Jacques Deveau forms a quartet that embodies the essence of our rich musical heritage and generous spirit. This group is a familiar presence at the Matagans Lions Club monthly dinner, where they entertain their neighbors, adding joy to this beloved community gathering. Furthermore, their generosity extends to the countless benefits and fundraisers over the year, particularly during the holiday season where they participate in events like the Christmas fundraiser Papa Noel and perform at both the Christmas community dinner and Christmas for the holiday celebrations. I ask that all members join me in expressing our heartfelt gratitude to Jacques Deveau and friends for their selfless contributions and for making every event they attend truly special. Merci. I recognize the honourable member for Queen's. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to pay tribute to Donald Glynott, who will soon be retiring as Chief of the Mill Village and District Fire Department after 34 years of exemplary service in the role. Donald joined the Fire Department in 1977 before being elected as Chief in 1989. Through his impressive leadership, selfless dedication, and the inclusive culture he has nurtured, Donald has ensured the highest of standards within his department. This includes the recruitment and retention of new members who relish being part of his team and the undertaking of fundraising initiatives to finance the maintenance and purchase of essential firefighting equipment. So it is with great pleasure and gratitude that I thank Donald for his dedicated service to the community and I wish him the very best in the next chapter of his life. You will be missed, Chief. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to recognize Derek Strong, a familiar face at the annual St. Margaret's Bay Lions Club Christmas tree sale, and a dedicated volunteer who has a genuine concern for residents in his general community. This past Christmas, Derek helped sell 700 real balsam fir trees to provide funding to support people in the community throughout the year. The money raised selling Christmas trees was used to purchase food certificates for the residents affected by the wildfires in our region, for breakfast programs at two elementary schools, and for bursaries for students graduating from Bayview High School. Money was also given to help the Bayview hockey team, the Vimy 250 Air Cadets, and the St. Margaret's Bay 328 Sea Cadets in exchange for their assistance unloading the trees and helping the Lions to sell and carry trees to customers. I'd like the members of the host of assembly to join me in thanking Derek for generously giving his time and experience in supporting community-based organizations and making a difference in the lives of people in our community. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honorable member for Sackville Cobbequid. Madam Speaker, I rise today to congratulate last year's 2023 inductees to the Sackville Sports Heritage Hall of Fame. The Sackville Sports Heritage Foundation was established in 1981 with a mandate to honor 
amateur athletes, teams and administrators involved in local competition and beyond. The following 2023 inductees were honored last year. Sean Healy, builder and coach in gymnastics. Paula O'Connell, athlete in arm wrestling. Pat Henneberry, builder and coach in basketball. Mike Lidstone, builder and coach in wrestling. Gord Dwyer, builder and official in hockey, who also refereed Stanley Cup finals last year. Daryl Dempster, builder and coach in athletics, wrestling and school sports. Chris Scott, athlete in arm wrestling. Madam Speaker, I would like to ask that all members of the House of Assembly join me in congratulating the 2023 Sackville Sports Heritage Hall of Fame inductees and wish them continued success. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Bedford Basin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to congratulate the Bedford players on their most recent theatrical offering, Unassisted Living. This year, the players performed two one-act plays by J.L. Allen, Some Guy from the Internet, and Octogenarians of Anarchy. The plays ran until March 16th. Community theatre has a proud history in Bedford that goes back to at least the 1950s, and at one time there were actually two community theatre groups operating, which is pretty amazing when you consider how small Bedford was back then. These days, the theatre troupe operates out of the Church Hall at All Saints Anglican. Money raised from this season will go to support the work of Beacon House Food Bank, and we all know how important that assistance is these days. I want to congratulate the cast, crew, and everyone involved in this latest production for their theatrical, theatrical success and their kindness to those experiencing food insecurity in our area. I recognize the Honourable Member for Shelburne. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize the Shelburne Reenactment Association, known as the New Jersey Volunteers 3rd Battalion, in their effort to preserve Shelburne's loyalist history. The regiment is the largest active living history group in the Maritimes, and it has a membership consisting of children and adults and demonstrates an historically accurate reenactment of 18th century life, uh, with everything from uniforms to camp life being 100% at this uh, Authentic, and they do a great job too. The regiment is on the waterfront every Sunday performing military drills as well as various events throughout the county and the province. Madam Speaker, I respectfully ask all members join me in thanking the members of the regiment for keeping this loyalist history alive. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honourable member for Sydney, member two. Uh, thank you. I think, Madam Speaker, I rise my place to recognize uh, the Cape Breton Post. Uh, and uh, Cape Breton Post is part of the Saltwire Network, which we all know is going through a transition. But I do want to rise my place and recognize uh, our local newspaper that plays a, a very significant part in our community. Uh, I have a 13 year and change relationship with them, both in municipal and provincial politics. Uh, and they were tough and they were fair and they were balanced uh, every time. And I, uh, I, you build relationships uh, with these people. These are families in the community. Uh, and um, uh, not only do they do excellent work uh, as a newspaper, but they also contribute a lot back to the community. I do want a, a quick example for how important local journalism is. Uh, the story about fact graphing was done by the Cape Breton Post. The story around the story around doctors being able to purchase homes when they come here, that was a national policy change. That was written by uh, Barb Sweet with the Cape Breton Post. So local journalism matters. So I rise my place to recognize everyone at the Cape Breton Post. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise uh, in the House today to recognize the volunteers at the East Dartmouth Christian Food Bank. These hardworking community members, led by Shireen Tawil, spend much of their time ensuring that donated food reaches those who need it most. I've had the opportunity to tour this food bank many times, and the last visit was with the Premier, and I can say with absolute certainty to this House that every donation is put to its best possible use, and that the hard work displayed by Shireen and her team are an example to all. Feeding our fellow community members is an honourable goal, and I'm very grateful to the volunteers who make this possible. Madam Speaker, I ask the members of this House to please join me in thanking Shireen Tawil and her team at the East Dartmouth Christian Food Bank. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for King South. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize a remarkable individual from Wolfville who recognized the urgency of housing 
the unhoused, and the acted. From sourcing tents to organizing essential supplies and providing a sympathetic ear, James Skinner's dedication to supporting the unhoused deserves our thanks. His compassionate response to the unhoused crisis exemplifies the spirit of finding solutions within the strength of our communities. Individuals like James embody the values of compassion and solidarity that we need to solve our province's most difficult social challenges. His selfless efforts reflect the essence of Nova Scotian kindness and generosity. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislative Assembly to join me in recognizing and thanking James Skinner for his unwavering commitment to supporting citizens facing urgent housing needs and for informing a path forward for sustainable solutions. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Preston. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize Larry Varon. Larry has been a member of the Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency Services for 28 years in a volunteer capacity, and now it is, it is his career. He is responsible for conducting fire inspections, fire investigations, and delivery of fire safety presentations. He continues to volunteer for the Greenland and District Fire Department. When the Tantalan wildfire happened in 2023, Mr. Varon assisted the wildland fire investigator from Department of Natural Resources and Renewables and various other government departments in the origin and cause investigation of the fire. He also conducted logistical needs for the Fire Prevention Division in support of the fire. Larry is chairperson of the Eastern Passage Cal Bay Benevolent Society and vice chair of the Fisherman's Coves Development Association. Larry has also served in the Canadian Navy, retiring with the rank of Master Seaman. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to please join me to recognize and thank Mr. Varon for his years of volunteer service and his assistance with the Tan Talon wildfire. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable, Honourable Member for Fairview Clayton Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, today I rise to shine a spotlight on Anna Chevalina, the talented owner of Soul Strings Music School, where music becomes a journey of self-discovery and mastery. With over 15 years of experience, Anna's music program is carefully crafted to nurture students into professional musicians, offering a unique learning environment that is both enriching and productive. Anna's passion for music knows no bounds, as evidenced by her extensive travels and collaborations with musicians from around the globe. Fairview Clayton Park has become her chosen home, providing her with the perfect platform to explore diverse cultures and share her love for music through performances and teaching. Anna's exceptional talent and creativity have earned her widespread acclaim, with her unique sound transcending boundaries and captivating audiences worldwide. Whether through live performances or recordings, Anna's technical prowess and musical versatility continue to leave a mark in the world of music. I commend Anna for her dedication to her craft and encourage all members to take in one of her live performances. It is an experience to remember. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook and Salmon River. Madam Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Sarah Bell Delorier on being named one of the Atlantic Canada's 25 most powerful women in business. Sarah Bell is the Executive Director of the Downtown Truro Partnership and this prestigious nomination is a testament to her outstanding leadership, innovation and impact on the business world in our region. Sarah Bell's dedication, vision, and unwavering determination have set her apart as a trailblazer and role model for aspiring leaders. Her achievements not only inspire colleagues and peers, but also highlight her significant contributions to the advancement of business and empowerment of women in the Atlantic region. I applaud Sarah Bell for this well-deserved honour and look forward to witnessing her continued success and influence in the years to come. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh I recognize the Honourable Member for Bedford South. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to echo uh, comments that were made earlier by my colleague from Bedford Basin uh, with regards to the, the passing of David Conley. Mr. Conley, as I knew him, was a longtime teacher at the elementary school that I went to, Basin View, where my son goes now. He, uh, I first got to know him really through basketball, which I was quite involved in. He was very involved in. And I remember seeing Mr. Conley walking around. He was a big walker. He was also very involved. Uh, as the member said, with Bedford Academy. I remember running into him last summer when he was dropping kids off at the uh, Lions Pool. Uh, he was just a wonderful, community-minded guy, kind of the, 
the people that we all know in our constituencies who are the bedrock of our communities. And so I just want to recognize Mr. Conley. It was a great loss for his family, of course, but for the broader community of Bedford as well. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honourable member for Eastern Passage. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize two wonderful pillars of the community of Eastern Passage, Michael Mick Stevenson and his late wife, Marilla. Mick and Marilla shared over 60 years of marriage in Eastern Passage, enriching our community with their presence. Together, they ran a successful business for many years, both selflessly giving their time to numerous organizations. Mick is a founding member of the Eastern Passage Knights of Columbus, as well as the local athletic association, sharing his passion for sports as a dedicated hockey and baseball coach. Marilla was a longtime member and founding president of the Eastern Passage Cow Bay Benevolent Society, also spending 50 years as member and past president of the St. Andrews CWL until her passing in 2020. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to join me in recognizing Mick and Marilla Stevenson for a lifetime of dedication to our community. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Dartmouth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today I stand to recognize a local Dartmouth-based author, Connie Dennis. Connie has written an educational children's book about Portland Estate's beloved Osprey named Pickles and his family that have been in the nest at Russell Lake for many years. It captures the story of Pickles the Osprey and is raising funds for hope for wildlife. Did you know the Osprey is the provincial bird of Nova Scotia? I invite you to go on an adventure with Pickles the Osprey and learn more about this amazing creature. Connie will be at Chapters in Dartmouth on April 6th signing copies of her heartwarming tale. Thank you to Connie Dennis, her husband Don Dennis, and illustrator Greg David for sharing the adventures of Pickles the Osprey and teaching us all about the amazing creature living right here in our own neighbourhood. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Hans West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Acadia University Associate Professor Amanda Peters on the overwhelming success of her first novel, The Berry Pickers. Amanda found inspiration for the story from her father, who was one of the many Mi'kmaq families that left the Maritimes in the 60s and 70s, bound for Bain to pick blueberries. The Berry Pickers won the 2023 Barnes & Noble Discovery Prize, the 2024 Carnage Medal of Excellence in Fiction, along with other nominations and achievements such as placing second on Amazon's Best Books for 2023. Although Amanda has traveled the world, she found her way back home and lives in Falmouth with her fur babies just across the street from her sister's family. While sharing her love of reading and writing with students at Acadia University, she was already working on her next novel, Waiting for the Long Night Moon, a collection of short fiction. Madam Speaker, I have no doubt her next novel will be nothing short of an exceptional story as well. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize an inspiring young female entrepreneur in my riding. I had the privilege to meet Katie Kelly, who owns and operates Maritime Interpreting and Translation. Madam Speaker, Ma Maritime Interpreting is an interpreting and translation organization where they bridge the gap in communication through interpreting and document translation in over 40 languages. Uh, they provide clarity to non-English speaking clients in their native languages, serving clients across Canada. Uh, I'm proud to stand and say that Maritime Interpreting and Translation is a WBE certified, which means they are recognized as a Canadian woman brand. Madam Speaker, I ask the House to join me in congratulating Katie Kelly on a successful female-owned business. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Glace Bay Dominion. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Victoria Haven Nursing Home in Glace Bay is led by Penny and Brenda, and they're absolutely amazing. I know this because I see it firsthand quite often. The Recreational Director, Doreen, and the Physiotherapist, Candia, are two more examples of staff that go above and beyond to ensure that residents have a good day. Too many to name, but the CCA support staff and the nurses are extraordinary indeed. For example, on Naval Day, staff built a ship in the lounge, and each employee was dressed to match a resident as they went on the trip. 
the pa they, they pack suitcases to go on an imaginary trip, and the website shows a parade of residents smiling as they go out on their voyage. A few months ago, they arranged for world-renowned Johnny Reed to come in and meet his truly his greatest fan. Every Sunday, they have a party called the Sunday Fun Day, and it's not uncommon for staff to volunteer for this. Madam Speaker, compassion at its best indeed. Thank you to the staff of Victoria Haven and to all of our long-term care facilities for taking care of our most beloved seniors. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Clare. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to highlight the recent banquet held by the St. Bernard Volunteer Fire Department on December 2nd. This annual event serves as a moment to honor the dedicated service and commitment of its members. Among the evening's notable traditions is the presentations of long service awards to, it, to its members. At this year's ceremony, the department honored Rissel Bilivo, Daniel Goda, Corey Muse, and Daniel Muse, as they were each presented with their esteemed 35-year service award. Their unwavering commitment to the St. Bernard F Volunteer Fire Department is truly commendable, having made this commitment at a young age and faithfully upheld it throughout their adult lives. I invite all members to join me in expressing our heartfelt gratitude to Richel Bilivo, Daniel Gada, Corey Muse, and Daniel Muse for their remarkable 35 year years of service to the St. Bernard Volunteer Fire Department. Merci. I recognize the honorable member of um, Colchester Mus Muscadabit Valley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, for the past three years, Students in Grade 8 Technology at South Colchester Academy have been making Mi'kmaq eight-pointed stars as their initial woodworking project. The stars have been distributed to teachers throughout the school for display in classrooms, the Cultural Alliance Room, the library, and other spaces. Some have been delivered to teachers at the elementary school as well as other schools. The eight-pointed star is a symbol of unity as well as the path of the sun, with white representing north, yellow east, Red South and Black West. Madam Speaker, I wish to recognize South Colchester Academy for ensuring its students are made aware of this important aspect of the Mi'kmaq culture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, um, I recognize the Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Madam Speaker, at 92 years young, Ali Henshide is a testament to vitality and zest for life. With the twinkle in her eye and the contagious energy that defies her age, she navigates through each day with boundless enthusiasm. Her vibrant spirit radiates through every aspect of her being, from her lively conversations to her spontaneous laughter that fills the room. Despite the passage of time, Allie remains an active member of her community, embodying the mantra that age is just a number. One of Allie's most remarkable traits is her unwavering independence demonstrated by her continued ability, ability to drive her friends to various events. Behind the wheel of her dependable car, she becomes the embodiment of freedom, fearlessly navigating the roads with the same confidence she possessed in her youth. To Allie, driving is just a means of transportation. It's a symbol of her resilience and determination to live life on her own terms. Her friends and neighbours marvel at her boundless energy and admire her unwavering optimism. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Guysboro uh, Tragedy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize the Country Harbour Gun Club, celebrating their 50th year in the community. It started in a church basement in 1974 with a group of four community members and an idea. Others joined in and it was decided to build the facility. When it first opened, it was an actual gun club for shooting competitions, but it was also used as a space for community events. Over the years, it has hosted bingo, card nights, dart league, weddings, open mic nights, winter carnivals, and community meals. Of course, I could not forget to mention the Smoky Hollows Holidays Community Festival that takes place every August. It's also known for hosting some great local ball teams and some friendly competition on the field next to the club. Volunteers are the heart of this organization, Madam Speaker, and it's their commitment to fundraising and applying for grants over the years has kept the gun club going. There are a lengthy list of longtime members who have been involved since the early days. However, I know that A.J. McIsaac, one of the original members, is currently serving as president, has a great team on the executive. Madam Speaker, I ask members of the House to join me Order. in congratulating the Country Outer Club. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> 
before I recognize the um, Honourable Government Host Leader, I would like to rule on the Cumberland North's um, point of order. Having reviewed the transcript for the questions and response referred to by the Honourable Member for Cumberland North in her point of order earlier today, I note that the reference to fear-mongering and scaring people by the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness were not directed at the Member for Cumberland North, but directed generally at the goings-on in the Chamber. However, this, the transcript also reveals that the member for Cumberland North was aware of the issue on Friday near the onset of her comments on Bill 149. During second reading, she alleged the minister said, I was fear-mongering and scaring people, which is quite an accusation to make here in the House. Thus, member also subsequently said that I... Do not believe that I was fear-mongering and trying to scare people, and later, I'm not fear-mongering, finally stated, and when the minister accuses me of fear-mongering. This shows the member was aware of the comments and could have raised a point of order at that time. Points of order should be raised at the moment of the... <clears throat> irregularity or as soon as possible thereafter. Thus, even if the language had been unparliamentary, the point of order should have been raised when the member became aware of the comments on Friday. Accordingly, the point of order is dismissed. I recognize the government host leader. Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that you now leave the chair and the House resolve itself into committee the whole House on bills. Motion is carried. We'll have a brief recess before we start Committee of the Whole.
order. I call the Committee of the Whole to order. I recognize the Honourable Government Host Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 407, Antigonish Consolidation Act. <clears throat> Bill 407, the Antigonish Consolidation <laughs> Act. I recognize the Clerk. Chair, Bill 407 was referred to the House by the Standing Committee on Law Amendments on March 7, 2024, without amendment and contains 20 clauses. <clears throat> Is there any debate on Clause 1? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Municipal Affairs and Housing. No. Uh, no. Clause 2, sorry. Okay. Page 1. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I'm happy to stand and, and speak to this bill. We have certainly heard from uh, a lot of community members through Antigonish Town and Antigonish County who have concerns about this, who do not feel the province has properly uh, consulted them on this piece of legislation, who do not have critical information in terms of what the impacts on their tax regime, and their finances is going to be. Um, I have to say, even in listening to the minister's uh, comments to uh, the press just before this piece of legislation was brought in, uh, he indicated that the UERB is going to evaluate the financial impact of this bill, of the consolidation, and then report on what that impact will be to the citizens. I mean, obviously that's putting the cart before the horse. Uh, that's information that should have been done previous to this piece of legislation even coming to the House. And the government's had two years to do that. I mean, I mean, the fact that this government is bringing in a piece of legislation, they've recognized that they have to answer the financial questions that people have on what, what's the impact uh, on my property tax, on our, our corporate tax rate, small business tax rate. Uh, the fact that they recognize that those are critical questions that need to be answered and haven't taken the time to do that before this piece of legislation has come in, I think is, is very concerning. And again, we, we continually see a government that acts before it thinks, which is why even in this session, they've had to backpedal at least on three separate pieces of, of legislation, including this one before us here, because they act before they think. There's no due diligence done in advance. And, and that is concerning. It's concerning when we are dealing with a cost of living crisis and people's property taxes have shot through the roof, their property assessments have gone up, when we're still paying the highest taxes in, in the country, um, and along with paying some of the highest increases to housing and, uh, and inflation here in Nova Scotia, greater than other parts of, of the country that this government doesn't even know what the impacts on people's finances are going to be around the taxation structure for any Ganesh. Uh, a, a key flaw in the provincial part of, of the process here. Uh, so we, we certainly continue to have concerns about this bill and we'll certainly uh, voice the concerns we're hearing from community members. Um, again, concerns related to the process through which we've got to this point the questions that are not answered, the potential, potential impacts on, on future elections. And I would say at the heart of all the concerns related to this uh, is the fact that the Premier has not kept his word on how he would approach municipal amalgamation. And this is certainly uh, a concern order, for the community. Order. I ask for the um, leader of the official opposition to retract that statement. It is unparliamentary. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, I recognize the honourable um, leader for the official opposition. Thank you. Certainly, if I said anything unparliamentary, I'll retract that for the record. What I will say, uh, there's a concern amongst the community and I think amongst members on this side of the House that the Premier said one thing in opposition when consolidation and amalgamation was being looked at in his own community, and he has done the opposite now that he's become Premier. So the, the specific quote I'm referencing here, Madam Chair, uh, is the Premier, again, very clearly articulating multiple times when this question was brought up. Uh, in, the, in, in the PICTOs with the five municipal units that were looking at amalgamation there. Again, where there was the financial 
questions that were answered. People knew what the impacts were going to be on their taxation. All of that homework was done in advance of that uh, plebiscite that happened, and there was indeed a plebiscite that uh, I was Minister of Municipal Affairs at the time that we certainly um, allowed to happen. Uh, and it was negative, and, and we followed through with the with the with the what the consensus seemed to be, or the majority vote was with the community. But again, even in, even in that process where there was a lot more homework done, people knew what the impacts were going to be on their taxes going into that vote. Uh, people knew what amount of grants they were going to get from the province and what infrastructure projects were going to be funded. All of that homework was done in advance, very different than what's happening here with, with Annie Ganesh. And even with all of that information being present to the community and the councillors at the time and informing the decision of the plebiscite, the Premier at the time still said, any change to our governance structure should start with the people, what the people want. Uh, he advocated very clearly for a plebiscite in his community when he was in opposition, and again, now that he has assumed the position of Premier, as we've seen with numerous other issues, whether it's the Coastal Protection Act, um, or giving family doctors a pension, or a better paycheck guarantee for Nova Scotians, we've actually seen the opposite thing happen in this case, where the Premier is ready to bring in special legislation outside of the Municipal Government Act, um, without having given the people of the town of Antigonish and the county of Antigonish the same respect that his people were given in his community and that he, he demanded, in fact, when he was uh, in opposition. And that was that a plebiscite would happen. So that obviously is a source of frustration for a lot of people that one thing was said previously and the opposite thing is, 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 is happening here. Um, and again, there, there are still uh, so many questions that I believe need to be answered on this. Uh, there is a, uh, a a petition that I'll be tabling in third reading that has, I believe, over 4,200 signatures on, of people that are concerned about this. And uh, and to date, the government has not been able to answer those fundamental questions related to this legislation. And namely, in my opinion, from a provincial standpoint, what if anything this is going to save people in taxes? What the impact is going to be? Uh, what the uh, what projects are going to be funded by the province as a result of this? Will this open up or limit applications for infrastructure funding? And how are, how are people going to be governed uh, moving forward? So I do want to voice those concerns once again here um, as we proceed with Committee of the Whole, and we certainly do have some further amendments to this piece of legislation. I do, I do think there's been some encouraging amendments that we've heard are coming forward from Law Amendments Committee. I do want to thank the Minister for that. I think there's been some improvements to this bill that were in response to the pressure that government members certainly were feeling from that community. Um, and again, one, one thing, whatever you want to say about this government, is they, they do consistently re react and respond to, to pressure. Uh, and certainly the folks in Indiana have applied that pressure in this situation. Um, but we don't think the amendments uh, go far enough in terms of what the people from that area are looking for from what we're, from what we're hearing, and we will be speaking to further amendments to this piece of legislation as we move forward through Committee of the Whole. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North, or for Dartmouth North. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to rise and just say a few words. Um, when Bill 407 was introduced, um, there was, I think it's fair to say, quite an outcry of people who were opposed to the bill. And uh, this, of course, had been in the offing for some time because there had been the suggestion of legislation um, prior to its introduction. Um, lots of thorny municipal politics uh, that got us to this place. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, as, as I spoke to people with all variety of views uh, on this, the question I heard over and over again is, why does this piece of legislation exist at all? Um, there are provisions in the Municipal Governance Act uh, for municipalities that wish to amalgamate. Um, and so it has never been clear 
uh, neither uh, to, to me uh, nor to many people who are opposed to this, uh, why this has to go through the legislative process, period. Um, now, rather than um, actually address <laughs> these concerns, uh, you know, we heard that, as far as I can tell, essentially, um, the elected officials in the area all collectively decided that this was the right way forward, and there was a question um, from those folks who they represented about whether that was true. And I think at the end of the day, that's the controversy, if you will, around this act. And I think um, what we have before us today is uh, three pages of amendments of an act. I don't know how long the act itself is, but not a whole lot longer than that. Um, and I think it's very, very concerning for a couple of reasons. I think from a procedural perspective, we should have a new bill. Yeah. If this government wants to proceed uh, to do this via legislation, if they've <coughs> determined that this is the right way forward, that is their prerogative, this is a majority government, introduce a new bill. The reason I would suggest that that new bill is not going to come forward because is because we, we'd be here longer. We'd have to go back into law amendments, and I think that's something that this government does not wish to do. Um, but wish to do it or not, it's the right thing to do. And so um, it's, a, it's a strange situation to be called upon I mean, I can't really figure out what any of this means. <laughs> Lots of deleting clause ones, adding something after something else. And uh, yeah, well, the minister is saying he's happy to explain it, and so I look forward to that. I think that would be great. Um, I think a fulsome explanation of this bill uh, would be great. Um, might have been good at the introduction of the amendments, but we'll take it at the end. Um, and, you know, I, I guess I would just say that the criticism of this is around the process, the democratic process, that people felt like there should be a plebiscite um, and the government wished to proceed uh, via legislative tools instead. <coughs> the introduction of these amendments seems to be the government saying that they want to compromise um, and respect that people need more information if this will go ahead and that many residents of Anaganish felt like they didn't have the information they needed. Um, but I would suggest, again, that this still feels clumsy. I mean, if the government wants to proceed with the bill, I guess proceed with the bill. Um, but this, this doesn't feel like amendments to me. This feels like a whole new thing. And so for this whole new approach to come in at the 11th hour, at the end of a, of a budget session, um, when folks may or may not have, have had notice or been able to read it. I haven't been able to read it. I just saw it, so I can't say much more than that. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel like it's necessarily going to assuage the concerns of the people that maybe this is meant to address. Um, and I think it just introduces even more confusion. So I do appreciate that it, it is an effort to slightly depoliticize the process and to introduce more kind of accountability in terms of uh, moving this decision to the UARB and um, having transparent rationales. I think all of that is important and probably a step in the right direction, uh, but this still feels uh, like a very strange way to do it. And. Normally, when a bill would be introduced and I would make these comments, I would say I look forward to hearing from people <laughs> at law amendments. We won't be able to do that because essentially the government is introducing a new bill in the guise of amendments. So I, I'm sure we'll still hear from people <laughs> and uh, we'll see what, what those folks have to say. Um, but having just seen this, uh, those will be my comments for tonight. Thank you. I recognize the honorable member for Cole Harbor Dartmouth. Thank you. Well, I can just uh, imagine um, how happy the people in Antigonish, the municipal elected people, are watching this right now with this new development. Um, I already said in this house, as somebody who was in municipal politics for 12 years, in an amalgamated municipality, half the, muni half the size in population of the province and the growing pains that we endured over that period of time. And also during that period of time, um, the Utility and Review Board 
telling HRM Council that they were too large at 23 representatives and that they had to downsize to 16. And the inner workings and the pressure that was endured by all on council at that time was very difficult. And something that I will probably uh, remember for the rest of my life has been difficult. So I can only imagine what the council in Antigonish County and Antigonish Town has been going through. And I really want to um, appreciate and thank them for their efforts because it's not easy. And as I spoke earlier, that as a province who governs all the acts, you really need to lead and help your municipal units. And I've said it before, we are all elected the same way by the people. We all represent the same people. What was shocking to me, I guess, and what is surprising and disappointing is that when I came into this role as MLA, there was very little understanding of municipal government within this house. And silly me, as a critic for municipal affairs, I thought there would be more collaboration. Because had there been, we could have avoided all this. The process of working together is what I'm trying to get at. There are many of us here that came as municipal councillors and to those municipal councillors that are still doing the great work, getting the calls, late hours at the night, every day of the week. One of them told me, municipal councillors make the best MLAs. And there's a reason for that. Yes. Madam Chair, you can take your little bow at the same time <laughs> with the rest of us. <laughs> because we are the voice of the people and law amendments, however structured that process is, may appear to be transparent, but it ultimately is the voice of the people in here that show their understanding of municipal government. The Utility and Review Board as an arm's length means is a, you know, a good way of doing it, but it's yet to be seen. And as a member, as any councillor in Nova Scotia, as a member of the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities, they have been advocating for a clear process because there are other municipalities that are gonna be faced with the same difficult task as Antigonish finds itself in right now. So why would you not give them the tools and the process to follow instead of relying on the fact, well, Pictou County got their way with a plebiscite, so maybe that's the way to do it for any Ganesh. Or HRM is not, no one's happy with amalgamation, so why would we even, well then we'll threaten the word amalgamation so that people understand really how bad it is. The art of communication, which is interesting because we're talking about consolidation. So on, with those words, they needed to be said for every municipal representative in Nova Scotia right now to give them a fair process to follow. Because at the end of the day, unless they see the finances, of why they have to do this. And again, 12 years of an amalgamated HRM, it was a conversation that still goes on today to get a proper understanding of, am I really getting value for my municipal taxes? It will always be that way. And as I've told people, your taxes will never be fair, but it's up to your elected representatives to make them fairer. And on that note, I will sit down, but I had to, on behalf of every municipal representative in Nova Scotia, it needed to be said. Thank you. Shall Clause 1 carry? Carried. Carried. Clause 2. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. So I have a, uh, an extensive change sheet for Clause 2, Madam Chair, and uh, I will just 
Uh, before I read the change sheet, uh, I will just uh, talk briefly about the items in the in the change sheet, which are further explained. I will further explain as I go through it. So first of all, there is a name change where we're going from uh, transition coordinator to board liaison and coordinator, but that is one person. I, I, uh, I, have, uh, I am happy to tell the House that we, and we have said this uh, publicly, that we, uh, we will appoint former MLA, no stranger to this House, Michelle Samson, as uh, this coordinator and his, his uh, firm, Cox & Palmer, was engaged by the previous government in Windsor West Hand. So it's, I think it's a good choice for this role. We're very pleased about that, very pleased to have him uh, work in this way, in his, in his role. Uh, uh, in the legal profession. So the, there's a name change which filters right through every line where that term was there. It has to be changed. Uh, we are adding a, a requirement for a UARB fiscal review. So this was something that came out of uh, just listening to law amendments uh, and uh, is it in the financial best interest of both the residents of the county and town to do this consolidation. So we've asked the UARB to uh, report on that. If it is not in the financial interests of both the county and the town, then this process will stop. The UARB is required to report on that by a certain date. So that's a major change in the bill. Another major change in the bill because of hearing law amendments was that there was uh, a concern expressed of a perceived conflict of interest uh, perceived, I use that word, uh, in that uh, the transition team was going to be made up of the mayor and deputy mayor and the warden and deputy warden of the county and the town. And it's potential for one of those individuals to be running in the future, in the October election, to be on the future uh, consolidated entity. Uh, so that was a perceived conflict of interest. So we recognize that. And we have created a, uh, the, the committee is now a committee of one. So those are the major, the, the gist of the changes, but I will, I will read through these changes and explain them as I go through them. So I wish to move change to Bill 407. A copy of the changes should be circulated. And I will now read them aloud. Page 1, Clause 2. A. Add immediately before the definition of consolidated municipality the following definitions. Board means the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board. Board liaison and coordinator means the board liaison, a coordinator, uh, board liaison and coordinator appointed under Section 5. B. Delete the definition of coordinator. C. Replace the semicolon with a period in the definition of town. D. Delete definition of transition committee. Reasons for the amendment, this adds a definition of the board, term board to mean the UARB and changes the term coordinator to board liaison and coordinator, deletes the definition of transition committee as the duties formerly assigned to the transition committee will now be as the responsibility of the board liaison and coordinator. Page 1, Clause 3, Line 1, delete on and substitute with subject to Section 6 on. Reason for the amendment makes the dissolution of the town subject to the UARB's financial review under Clause 6. Page 2, subclause 5, brackets 1. Delete and substitute the following subclause. 1. The Governor and Council shall appoint a person for such a term and on such conditions as the Governor and Council determines to be the Board Liaison and Coordinator for the duration of the Board's involvement in and any transition period leading to the dissolution of the town and continuation of the county. Reason for this amendment clarifies that the role of the board liaison and coordinator is limited to the UARB's involvement and the transition period. Page 2, subclause 5, 2, line 1, add board liaison and before coordinator. Reason for the amendment Amendment amends the language in the clause to reflect the recommended revisions in Clause 2, i.e., changing coordinator to be board liaison and coordinator. Page 2, Clause 5, add the following subclause after subclause 2. 
Three, upon the first elected council taking office pursuant to this act, the appointment of the board liaison and coordinator is revoked. Reason for amendment specifies that the term of the board liaison and coordinator appointment is revoked upon the swearing in of the new council for the county following the October 24, 2024 election. Page two, clause six, delete and substitute the following clause, six, one. The board liaison and coordinator shall apply to the board for a determination of the board and shall determine by August 1, 2024, whether the dissolution of the town and continuation of the county as a, municipal, as a consolidated municipality are in the best financial interest of the residents of the town and county as a whole. Two, where the board determines that the dissolution of the town and the continuation of the county as a, the consolidated municipality are not in the best financial interest of the residents of the town and the county as a whole. A, on the dissolution date, the town is not, the town is not dissolved and the inhabitants of the town do not become residents of the consolidated municipality. And B, this act has no further force or effect. Reason for this amendment requires the board liaison and coordinator to apply to the UARB for determination as to whether consolidation is in the best financial in interest of the residents of the municipalities. If the UARB decides in the negative, then the consolidation process does not proceed. The board must render its decision by August 1, 2024. It deletes all provisions related to the transition committee. So page two, clause section seven, delete and substitute the following clause, seven one. The meetings of the board liaison coordinator must be held in accordance with the procedures required for a council of a municipality by the Municipal Government Act, except as provided by this act. The board and liaison coordinator two, sorry, sorry, the board and liaison coordinator may hold a virtual meeting if the requirements in section 19A of the Municipal Government Act except procedural policy are met. And three, the board and liaison coordinator may permit electronic submission form or electronic participation in a meeting by a staff member of municipal government, an expert, a resident, or an interested person. Reason for amendment, amends the language in the subclause to reflect that the duties formerly assigned to the transition committee will now be the responsibility of the board and liaison coordinator deletes quorum and voting requirements for the transition committee meetings as they are no longer necessary. Page two, clause, subclause eight, one, delete and substitute the following subclause. One, the board and liaison coordinator has the powers of the council of a municipality with respect to the gathering, collecting, and disseminating of information relating to the dissolution of the town and the continuation of the county as, a consolidate, as the consolidated municipality. Reason for amendment clarifies that the, the authority of the board liaison and coordinator to exercise the powers of a council under the Municipal Government Act is limited to information gathering for the purposes of consolidation. Page two, subclause eight, two, line one, delete transition committee and substitute board liaison and coordinator. Page two, subclause three, line one, delete transition committee and substitute board and liaison coordinator. Page two, subclause eight, four, delete, line one, delete transition committee and substitute board and liaison coordinator. Page two, subclause eight, five, line two, delete transition committee and substitute board and liaison coordinator. A reason for amendment, uh, updating the language of the subclause is to reflect the fact that the duties formerly assigned to the transition committee will now be the responsibility of the board and liaison coordinator. Page three, clause eight, add the following subclause after subclause five. For greater certainty, subclause six, for greater certainty, the board and liaison coordinator may exercise the board liaison and coordinator's power under this act only in the furtherance of the orderly dissolution of the town and the transition to the consolidated municipality. Reason for amendment clarifies that the authority of the board and liaison coordinator can be exercised solely in relation to the consolidation process. Page three, subclause nine, one, delete and substitute the following subclause. Board and liaison co coordinator shall appoint an interim chief administrative officer. Reason for amendment makes the board liaison 
and coordinator responsible for the appointment of the interim C chief administrative officer and removes the requirement to appoint the interim CAO by July 1, 2024. Page 3, subclause 10, 1, line 2, delete transition committee and substitute board and liaison coordinator. Page 4, subclause 11, 1, line 1, delete transition committee and substitute board and liaison coordinator. Page 4, subclause 11, 4, line 2, delete transition committee and substitutes board and liaison coordinator. Reason for amendment amends the language in the subclause to reflect the fact that the duties formerly assigned to the transition committee will now be the responsibility of the board and liaison coordinator. Page four, subclause 12, one A, line one, add board and liaison before coordinator. Lines one and two, delete Nova Scotia utility and review. Page four, subclause 12, two, delete and substitute the following subclause. Two, before the board and liaison coordinator applies to the board pursuant to subsection one, the board and liaison coordinator may determine that a mayor is to be elected at the first election of the consolidated municipality on October 19, 2024, notwithstanding the minimum time required by subsection 12.8 of the Municipal Government Act. Reason for the amendment amends the language in the subsections in keeping with the clause Changes in Clause 2, i.e. coordinator becomes board and liaison coordinator, and Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board becomes the board. <laughs> Page 4, subclause 12, 3, lines 1 and 2, add board and liaison before coordinator. Line 2, delete transition committee and substitute board and liaison coordinator. Page 5, subclause 14, 1, line 2, add board and liaison before coordinator, page five, subclause 14, two, line one, add board and liaison before coordinator, page five, subclause 14, six, and lines two and three, delete Nova Scotia utility and review. Page five, subclause 15, one, delete transition committee and substitute board and liaison coordinator. Reason for the amendments. Amends the language in the subclause is to reflect the fact that the duties formally assigned to the Transition Committee will now be the responsibility of the Board and Liaison Coordinator, amends the language in the subsections in keeping with the changes in Clause 2, i.e. Coordinator becomes Board and Liaison Coordinator, and the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board becomes the Board. And with that, I move the changes, these changes to Bill 407 be accepted, Madam Chair. I recognize the Honourable Leader for the Official Opposition. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, I mean, I, I hate to have to point out how ham-fisted uh, this piece of legislation has become, dating back from its inception at the provincial level to the latest example here. Uh, again, to clarify for the House and for anyone listening, what these amendments seem to do is to, one, enlist the UARB to conduct a fiscal review to determine if this act that is going to be passed this session by a majority government is going to have a negative financial impact on the people that this legislation uh, encompasses. If, if that's not putting the cart before the horse, I, I don't know what is. And, and, and again, none of this work happened before this piece of legislation was brought to the House. There was no thought from the government side to determine what the financial impacts of people are going to be as a result of this bill. No thought to what the financial impacts will be for the municipalities, let alone the taxpayers, in, in each of those. Uh, again, one has to point out that I think it's absolutely absurd that we have a, an amendment to a piece of legislation that would make the legislation null and void if the UARB determines that there'll be a negative financial impact. Why not know what that's going to be before we actually move forward with a piece of legislation? Especially considering that this government uh, allegedly has been working on this for two years and have been putting it off for two years. And none of this due diligence was done before this piece of legislation was brought to the chamber here. 
Again, this, this is the latest example in a back and forth, one step forward, two steps back, that this government has taken all the way through. Oh, we're, we're going to do this legislation, we support the municipalities on this, then political pressure arises, actually, no, we're not going to do this, we're going to step back. Then there's a court challenge, well, we're, we can't move forward without the court challenge being dealt with. Uh, and now we have the third time in this chamber, for the third time in this chamber, Again, I think there's only been three pieces of legislation brought in by the government. The government having to step back, make amendments because they hadn't done the due diligence to begin with on this. And, and this just isn't due diligence. This is a fundamental question that should have been asked and answered two years ago while people have been debating this issue locally in Antigonish. Does the minister not think that if people knew what the financial impacts were going to be, heading into this, that there probably would have been a lot less confusion and division in the community over this piece of legislation, that maybe some of the questions people have would have been answered. And here we have the minister in this amendment actually recognizing that that's been a big problem in this process to begin with. By in the 11th hour bringing in an amendment to say, oh, by the way, we do need to pay attention to the fiscal impacts of this, without any definition of what that's going to be. So, okay, is the URB looking at the, the fiscal impact to the municipal units? What if it's beneficial to one and not the other? Is the UARB looking at the impact to the taxpayer? What if it's beneficial to one group of taxpayers and not the other? What determines whether it's a positive impact uh, or not? None of that is described in this amendment. The minister has not been able to articulate that. I hope he does before he concludes debate uh, on this amendment. But again, no information, no definition of what even side of the fiscal impact that this government's looking at, whether it's tax rates, whether it's uh, debt accrued by, by one of the municipalities. You know, we don't even know what, what the UARB is, is looking at here. Um, and that's a big problem. And again, this is the third piece of legislation, three for three where the government has had to say, you know what, we got it wrong, we've got to step back and try again. Three for three, 100% of the legislation that's been brought into this House, the government has had to say, oh, actually, we may have got this wrong. We have to step back. Um, again, that is a problem, and the, and the government tries to make this a virtue. Well, we're willing to listen. We're willing to listen when people have issues. We, we are, we'll admit when we're wrong. That is virtuous. The problem is, is the homework isn't being done in advance, and what this government is doing is reacting to localized pressure instead of engaging in, in proper work of planning and, and development of well-thought-out legislation that the House can actually have trust in and that the people of this province can trust in and believe in. And, and again, 100% uh, of the legislation brought in, the government has had to do this, step back, and try again. And it's still not well thought through. We still don't have answers to the questions on this in this, in, in this amendment. So the government is now saying, well, you know what, we realize that people should know what the fiscal impact of this is going to be, and if it's bad, then, you know, we won't move forward with this. But they're passing this, this legislation in this session of the House. The cart, you could not have a clearer example of the cart being put before the horse uh, more than in this particular amendment right here. Uh, and again, without any clarity on, on what the UARB will actually be evaluating, what happens if one taxpayer uh, ends up doing better and the other one doesn't, what decision will the government make there uh, if it's a wash uh, where there's, there's a group of people being negatively impacted and a group of people being positively impacted? I don't even, I don't even, I think the problem is the government hasn't even thought about what it's going to do in that situation. Uh, because, again, this government spends a lot of time acting before they think. Um, and this is a, another clear example of this. And, uh, again, I, I, I think looking at the government's actions on this, they keep trying to find a scapegoat or smokescreen to stand behind uh, or blame on the situation. First, it's the municipalities. Well, they're the ones that really want to do it, even though it's provincial legislation that is required to pass this. Uh, then it was the courts. Now it's the UARB. And now it's also Michelle Sampson, which is the second part of this.
You know, what, one, has to, one has to point out a great, a great irony of this government, a, a wonderful, beautiful, hilarious irony of this government. Every single day, we've got to listen to the Premier and Ministers stand up and talk about how terrible Liberals are and that Liberals never did anything, they had no vision, they were terrible at government, and yet when it comes to their best ideas, when it comes to their best ideas, it comes from the Liberal benches, and, and they're, they're all also really quick to take, take on Liberal individuals every chance they get to help fix their messes and to create a, a, a person to hide, before, a hide behind. That's what's going on here, right? So, so let's talk about this decision to, to uh, disband a committee of multiple people and to replace them with the Honourable Mich Michelle Sampson, who I'm very fond of, who's a very talented and capable individual, and I'm glad that he's getting paid uh, by the Conservative government, and I, I'm glad he's making some money off the Conservative government with this. But again, let's, we have to question the intentions of this decision. We just have to question the intention of the decision. So Michelle, as talented as he is, does not have any experience in dealing with municipal amalgamations. Um, he's never done it before. I think this is a great uh, experience for him to engage in. Uh, but the government didn't pick someone that has been engaged with this file before or that, that has experience in this. They, they picked a former, former liberal cabinet minister. Uh, and again, great. <laughs> but the question is why? And, and I, think, I think the answer to that question is, is very obvious. It is to be able to blame this situation or hide behind this individual and say, well, it's just a, it's just a liberal that's doing this. Uh, it's to, to, to thumb their nose at the opposition by, by trying to create these sorts of, of smoke screens. Uh, and I believe there's a, a political intention to try and prevent us from doing our job and asking hard questions and advocating on behalf of the community of Annie Ganesh by doing something like this. So I do want to assure the minister that that won't change anything. And if anybody understands that, no one understands that, in fact, better than Michelle Sampson. <laughs> um, but I do want to congratulate Michelle on this, but do have to obviously point out and question the, the motivation, uh, very clear political and partisan motivation uh, for, for doing that. And again, it's, it's the, 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 the efforts of this government have been focused on creating smoke screens and scapegoats to blame and hide behind. And I do not think that is a courageous way to govern. Um, I think it's the opposite, uh, in fact. And these two, uh, this amendment, as I understand them, to finally beg the question of the financial implications for this is... Uh, again, nonsensical to do this uh, after the legislation has been passed in the chamber. That, that is a nonsensical thing to do, and I'm, I'm sure that is self-evident. Um, and then to also, you know, try to play uh, some sort of petty partisan game here with disbanding a, a committee and putting in uh, a former Liberal partisan in that place, uh, I, think, I think shows where the priority is of this government on this legislation. It, it, it has always been about trying to navigate the local politics of this instead of doing what they believe is right and standing firmly behind that. And I, I think that couldn't be any clearer uh, than it is with these two amendments that have been brought forward. Uh, again, if this, if this government took legislation seriously, the responsibility seriously to bring forward good pieces of legislation that have positive impacts on the lives of people, we wouldn't be in the situation where in this session for 100% of the legislation that's been brought in, they've had to step back, apologize, and, and, and change course. That is, uh, again, we have the latest example here, a, a clear indication of a government that acts before they think, that is uh, reactive instead of being proactive, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the actions of a government that we have to continue to question the competency of. Thank you very much. I recognize the honourable member for Sydney, member two. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm just going to take a minute. I'm not going to talk too long, but uh, I, I do. I do find it uh, interesting. The, the minister, he's almost like the fixer of the government. Like I feel like every time the government uh, does this, where they'll not consult or they'll make a decision and they need to fix it or try to fix it, 
the poor Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing seems to be the guy that has to pick up the pieces. And I say that with a compliment. I, like, I, I, I do, because here he is. Here he is trying to do his, uh, and he may agree with me, um, uh, here he is trying to uh, fix something that uh, obviously uh, wasn't thought out completely. As the leader, my leader said, uh, you know, they're batting a thousand when it comes to pulling back legislation uh, this session. The FMA is a mess. Um, and so here's this piece now, you have the amalgamation uh, of Antigonish, and I know both councils have uh, had the privilege of being a municipal affairs minister way back when. Uh, good people, um, but people have questions. I also remember living the amalgamation of the CBRM, which was forced. That was just, you're going to be a super city. I remember those conversations uh, way back when, when I, uh, with some of my family who were on council back then. But the point, the point I'm trying to make is, is that, you know, obvious to me with this is that you, you, you're, you're implementing you know, a financial review process now, like, just wh why do you even have the bill on the floor right now if, if any of this stuff isn't done? And it's like, you know, so now all of a sudden you're coming in at the 11th hour with a number of steps that you're going to try to take um, uh, that, that should have been done long ago. And, um, you know, amalgamation is, is part of life. Like, we've seen it in other communities. The, the, ultimately, the communities will make a decision. Uh, some of them have been smoother than others. Some of them have been forced. Uh, as my colleague said, who's a councillor at the HRM, there's still people who are very, uh, that will never accept amalgamation in the CBRM. But in this case, you had the community with a lot of questions, uh, and you had a government that didn't uh, do, do, do their homework, really. Uh, and now here we are with a number of amendments coming uh, to this. But as my leader said, it's a trend. You, know, you look back at the non-residence tax. That was a mess. That had to be pulled back. You were into uh, you're into three uh, bills this session, all being pulled back. Look at the wine sector again. I, I the, the minister had to come in, and you know he has a lot of experience, uh, uh, you know, and his background. Uh, and I'm sure he had a part to play in, in, in convincing the government that their, their policy around wine was wrong and that it was going to impact the sector. So that's why I call him the fixer. So he has to come in and fix this stuff. So uh, it, it's true. <laughs> it's a trend. It's, a, it's also a trend, you know. Order. But, 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 or no. Order. Um, I think we've all had a lot of fun, but uh, it's, it's time to settle down a bit. I've asked everyone to respect the person who is speaking. <laughs> I recognize the honorable member for Sydney member. Thank two. you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and, and, and the minister's trying to fix this. I don't think it fixes it. But here he is trying to bring in uh, all these policies and changes at the 11th hour, which at the foundation of this, it's politics. The advice was to go in. They were hearing that the community was supportive of the amalgamation, which many in the community probably are. So as a government, they made a decision. They didn't do the due diligence, and it put two cabinet ministers in jeopardy. That's what it did. And I was hearing it out of the community. It was very divided. It was very divided. And what this did was put two of their members at risk, two members that didn't have the information, that had to go back into their communities and try to explain the financial issues around the amalgamation. Well, what does this mean for my taxes? What does this mean? So now, all of a sudden, these are coming in. Because at the foundation of this, it is politics, when it didn't have to be. There were amalgamations that happened. They went along their journey as communities. They ended up amalgamating as communities. It was a lot more forthright and clean uh, how the process was. In this case, they came forward with amalgamation because they thought it was the right thing to do. And they found out very quickly that two of their members who were both in cabinet were going to be in trouble. They were, because people, even if they supported the amalgamation, didn't have the information around what the financial impacts were going to be to them, or their business, or their families. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there for now. I just wanted, I wanted to make that point. Um, I just I don't understand why, um, uh, how you can bring all of this in now, knowing what was happening for the last number of weeks. So uh, with that, Madam Speaker, I'll take my seat. I recognize the Honourable Member for King South. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I had no intentions to speak to this bill, but uh, again, I find myself needing to get on 
my feet when it comes to municipal issues, and I just wanted to make a, a couple uh, observations. Um, clearly, amalgamations uh, are difficult, uh, and they uh, can be very, very polarizing. We have seen this in, in other conversations. Uh, I was present in Hansport at a community meeting. Um, but what, but I, I, I think what's really important in making these decisions is that the community is at the heart of that. And the community needs to make, have its conversation amongst its community leaders. And when they make those decisions, they need to ensure that their electorate are informed and have a very clear understanding of all the issues that are being considered by the leadership of their communities. And clearly this uh, piece of legislation seems to be identifying that there was a major gap in information before the decisions were made by those two councils. Fair enough, if there's a gap in information uh, for uh, those councils to make their decision, then it does seem reasonable to go back and, and get that information. But this bill is, in fact, the absolute opposite way that you should go back and get that information. Uh, and I'm going to just touch on, you know, one element that uh, uh, my colleague from Yarmouth indicated is how have you defined the best financial interest of the residents? There's no definition here. Whoever is going out and doing this work uh, ha has no guideposts. Well, you know, is it short term? Is it long term? Are you factoring in the long term economic attractiveness of a community versus the tax rates? The issues of, of, of planning and, and, and the future of the community. This is where I, I just come back that these decisions need to be made locally. And I think the, the uh, main uh, or, or the, the, the real crime here is now taking this decision and the way it is worded in this legislation and giving it now to an unelected body that doesn't have any relationship with those communities. And if you think of how many times we get calls when power rates go up about the URRB as an unelected board making those decisions, how can that be? You know, we understand they're, they're doing their job in a, as a regulator. But this is very different than being a regulator. This is now as I'm reading this amendment, saying the final decision on the amalgamation, after all the debate in the community, presumably hashing out the issues of identity and governance and re representation, and those should all be factors, as well as the financial impact, long-term, short-term, urban, rural, etc. But they should all be taken together to make that very difficult decision. And it should be made, that decision should be made by local leaders in consultation with their citizens, ensuring that there is a process in which the citizens are informed of all the issues under consideration by their leadership. But to now take this and send that decision to Halifax, to the URRB, an unelected body who are now going to make the final decisions on behalf of the people of the town of Antigonish and the county of Antigonish. That seems to me to be fundamentally democratically wrong as these communities navigate through the difficult conversations that need to be had to examine amalgamation. So based on what's before us, what should be happening is that the government, in support of the municipality, say, says, okay, we feel that there's a gap in financial information. We will go 
and have you hire somebody to do the financial analysis so that you can communicate that to your citizens and then re-examine that as the community leaders. But instead, the heavy hand of the provincial government is weighing in here for some bizarre reason, and maybe it's political, as my colleague from Sydney member two says, maybe it's about a, a couple provincial seats, but to take this and, and put it into the hands of the URB to have the final say does not seem right. And so I just, I, I wanted to make that, that, uh, that point, because I'm a firm believer in citizens and their leaders making decisions for themselves. And it's one thing for the provincial body to, to drive this, but now the provincial body is saying, oh, we don't want our hands on this, let's go to the URRB. And then everybody can blame the URRB as an unelected body. But I think what you're hearing here today from opposition is there is a fundamental problem of process in which the government is now taking responsibility for what will continue to be a failed and completely unresolved issue that will end very badly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Shall amendment Gov 1 carry? Carried. Carried. Clause 2. Carried. Carried. I look. I recognize the Honourable Member of Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have the following amendment on change sheet Lib 1. Page 1, Clause 2, definition of dissolution date, delete November 1, 2024, and substitute the date that is eight months after the date plebiscites are conducted pursuant to Section 5. Page 2, add the following clause after Clause 4. 5-1, the town and the county shall each conduct a plebiscite on the same date, asking the respective residents to vote on whether they wish to proceed <coughs> with the dissolution of the town and continuation of the county as the consolidated municipality pursuant to this act. Two, a plebiscite conducted pursuant to subsection one must take place after an independent analysis is undertaken by the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board as to whether the dissolution of the town and the continuation of the county as the consolidated municipality are in the best financial interests of residents. Three, where a plebiscite conducted pursuant to subsection one does not result in a majority vote in the affirmative. A, the town will not be resolved and the residents of the town will not become residents of the consolidated municipality. And B, this act has no further force or effect. Renumber and adjust cross, cross references accordingly. So I think we had to modify our, our amendment because the government did bring forward the latter part of this amendment here to conduct the financial review, uh, something that our caucus obviously believes should have happened a long time ago, should this have been the direction that the government wanted to go forward with in consolidating municipal units. Uh, this amendment, I think, would also uh, allow a more direct form of democracy for residents of both the county and the town of Antigonish, whether or not folks are for the amalgamation or not. This, along with any kind of review that takes place uh, and that is given to the Utility and Review Board to analyze whether or not there's a certain group that gets a benefit, another group that does not, at least then they have more information to make that decision. So it's about process in this uh, regard. Um, it's a pretty straightforward amendment. Uh, I'll just say, echoing comments that have already been made, that it's highly unusual first to bring a bill to the legislature that focuses on two municipal units and changing the process just for two units. It's highly unusual for an amendment to come to the floor that takes the minister over 10 minutes to read to go through. There's that many changes that it's a really a whole new bill and process. And it's finally, again, highly unusual to put an amendment forward that actually looks at a financial review of the impact of the act that they're trying to pass and they're still going through with passing the act despite that. The government does talk a lot about personal responsibility. Uh, I think we've seen that, especially with the Coastal Protection Act, another act that was changed, that was actually removed entirely. So they want 
landowners along the coast to make decisions on their own property, given the right information, but they don't want residents that live in Nanaganish County in the town to be able to make the own, their own decision <laughs> and vote for which municipality if they want to stay in the municipality that they're in or be part of the creation of a consolidation. And, and so that's the intent of mandating a plebiscite in this area so that this place can have the same opportunity as Pictou County did. As the once leader of opposition, now Premier, said in 2018, that any change to our governance structure should start with the people as he defended the need for that plebiscite in his own community of Pictou County. So this amendment would provide some more consistency, whether or not a plebiscite is something that we should look at for all amalgamations or not is besides the point. We had a neighboring community have that opportunity, and there's many people reaching out to us in Antigonish that are simply asking for a plebiscite, and if the government really believes that the majority of the residents in these two municipalities will benefit from, then they should not be afraid to actually put the vote to the residents to have the decision on that. We know there's been petitions that have been brought forward with thousands of names on it. Surely there have been some concerns raised on the process of how this all unfolded. And I do want to recognize there's, there's a lot of good work that the council and, and the mayors have done in, in, in trying to advocate for what they see as a benefit to their community. But whether or not this financial audit brings, or financial review as it's called, brings back who benefits and then making this, the decision away from elected members, I think is problematic. I think without that definition, is it, is it one county that benefits? Is it the town? Is it 51% of residents? Is that the definition that benefit? Well, what about the other 49% of residents that have their taxes go up? Amalgamation is actually much more than about trying to have taxes stay the same or go down. Amalgamation or consolidation should be more about improving services for the collective, for their area. Actually, one of the best benefits to amalgamation in, in HRM was environmental. Nobody wanted to deal with the Halifax Harbour cleanup because it was everybody's problem. And sometimes when it's everybody's problem, it's nobody's problem. So we had, and that's just one example. I mean, we had issues with different especially Dartmouth, I have to say, where they're running out of their own water and had a tax problem. Um, we had other uh, places like the city of Halifax, the county that was in a better stable position. Uh, so there's always reasons why people are looking to, to consolidate. We haven't really heard the argument as to why the government wants to see these two municipal units consolidate with specific legislation and without a say, a direct say for the residents to make that decision. By supporting this amendment, they will support what they've already put forward on the fiscal review and they will allow residents to finally have a say on whether or not they will see themselves in a consolidated Antigonish and they shouldn't be afraid to put that vote to voters given the right information that the voters would have in their hand. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Britain Centre, Whitney Pier. Thank you, Chair. And I'm, I'm going to be fairly brief. Um, I just want to say, with with this, you know, I'm looking at. A, I feel like after the Minister's amendments, I'm looking at a whole new bill. I feel like kind of like this is almost second reading of that said bill. Um, but with regards to this amendment on the plebiscite, this is what I've heard when I was speaking with many people in Antigonish and the litany of emails I received on the topic of, of this bill, it has been consistently a plebiscite. That's what they've asked for. They want a vote. Um, they feel like the democratic process had been eroded. Um, they feel like their voices had not been heard. And most of that comes from the fact that during the last election, this was not an issue on the doorsteps that they heard from. So they didn't get <laughs> to have those public debates on this with regards to candidates. 
So two years into a mandate, this, this idea of first amalgamation, first it was amalgamation, and for several, and for I think a year or more, it was about amalgamation, and then all of a sudden, it changed to consolidation. And the difference between that, the difference was plebiscite or no plebiscite. And people, you know, felt very concerned about that. And it's very concerning. Coming from an, a community that I come from, CBRM, the forced amalgamation is still bitter, as uh, the member, Sydney member two spoke about. It's a bitter taste. Men, it's very contentious still. It's something that, you know, don't bring it up if you don't want to go two hours into a debate with somebody. And that's anybody at Tim Hortons or anywhere else. And so what let Anna Nish decide, this group that formed, was they were neither pro nor anti-consolidation. Let Anna Ginch decide was in their, their name. They wanted to decide, they wanted a plebiscite. This provides that plebiscite that they are asking for, and I honestly still can't understand a reason why not to have a plebiscite if it allows for everyone to feel like they've had their say. And with that, I'll take my seat. Thank you. Shall Amendment Lib 1 carry? Carry. Uh, the amendment is defeated. Clause 2. Oh, yes. I recognize the honorable leader of the official opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, we move these changes um, from recommendations from members of the community who are concerned about their ability to vote at large uh, for a mayor. Uh, we, we move this on behalf of folks that are looking to have an elected mayor as opposed to a, a warden model where that individual is chosen from council. Um, again, once this legislation moves forward, I'll move forward. I'll, I'll move through the change sheet. Page one, clause two, definition of mayor. Delete if. Page four, subclause twelve. Two, delete and substitute the following subclause. Two, a mayor is to be elected at large at the first election for the consolidated municipality on October 19th, 2024, notwithstanding the minimum time required by subsection 12.8 of the Municipal Government Act. Page four, subclause 12.3, delete whether the transition committee has decided. Page five, subclause 14.1, delete if applicable. Page five, subclause 14.2, delete if applicable. Page seven, subclause 19.2, delete warden or mayor as the case may be and substitute mayor. Uh, the purpose of this, again, it's coming from uh, requests from the community, uh, is that these things be very clear in the legislation. Again, we, we have a, a bill that's going to be passed here by the majority government where there is no clarity or certainty provided to the community on what their governance structure is going to look like, what their taxations are going to be, how services are going to be improved, absolutely nothing. This is special legislation. And again, this work has to be done by the province. The province can't just say this needs to be done at the municipal level. This is provincial legislation. There's two people from Antigonish and Antigonish County that get to vote on this. It's the member for Antigonish and the, the member for, for Guysboro. Those are the only two individuals that get to vote on this particular piece of legislation from that community. Uh, and again, this legislation does not provide clarity on what the most significant impacts uh, are going to be for the community of Antigonish, namely what the governance structure is going to look like what the fiscal impact is going to be, and as the member for, for Timberley Prospect said, what the uh, service implications are. I mean, again, very concerning that none of this work has been done in advance of this legislation, that the province has not taken any time to uh, inform the community what the answers are to their biggest questions and most fundamental questions. And certainly at least this amendment would provide clarity on the governance structure that the community would have. Um, again, something they have not been able to have a say on to date. Um, and we urge the government to support this uh, because we believe it would uh, increase at least the, the ability of the bill to provide some necessary answers for people uh, in terms of how they're going to be governed and, and how people are going to be elected, because those answers are not 
clear at all right now to those folks who care deeply about the future of their communities and and how their representation is uh, going to be structured. Thank you. Shall, shall Amendment Liberal 2 carry? Aye. It shall clause <clears throat> this has been defeated? Shall clause two carry? Carry. Shall clause shall the remaining clause? Oh, sorry, clause three is carried. Shall, or two is carried. Shall the remaining clauses three to twenty carry? Carried. Sh carried. Shall the title carry? Carried. The title is carried. Shall the bill carry? Carried. The bill is carried. Order. I recognize the Honourable Government Host Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 404, Energy Reform 2024? Bill 404, the Energy Reform 2024 Act. Is there any uh, further debate on Clause 66 amendments? Um, before I before I call, would is there any objection to um, distributing the rest of the or, uh, change sheets? All at once. Yeah, we can. I can speak to the. I can speak the amendment to the motion. For for for. Um, just for information, we are at Clause 66, but I'm asking if anyone minds if we distribute the rest of the change orders so that way everybody has them. Okay, so we are going to take a short recess and um, distribute all of the change orders. Thank you.
Order, order. I'll, I'll call the committee of the whole house on bills back to order. Um, is there any further debate on Clause 66? And I'll recognize the honourable member for Fairview, Clayton Park. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I'll just, you know, we, we've been on a bit of a pause since the last time we talked about this bill, so I wanted to just um, recap that uh, the amendment that we had proposed, I believe it was moved by the, the leader of the official opposition. So the government, governor and council may make regulations respecting public procurements by large-scale public utilities that ensure all procurements are tendered and go through government procurement processes. So so you're gonna, I'm going to kind of repeat myself throughout most of the night because most of our amendments are have the same uh, goal in mind, and that is to take what we think is a good piece of, le piece of legislation and strengthen it. Um, and one of the ways that we see that it's important to strengthen this piece of le legislation is to make sure that we have as, as transparent a procurement process as possible. We're introducing a second layer of, of, uh, of a board. There's going to be now two boards that handle um, energy within this province. And so it's important to us that um, the integrity of every procurement that goes out there is maintained and that it's not mired in, in red tape or in um, any sort of cloak and dagger. I know that's probably not parliamentary, but but it is important to us that that these procurements are done in a very transparent way to make sure that Nova Scotians are fully informed in what is happening and that the fairest procurement process is, is taking place. Um, and with that, I will take my seat. Uh, shall the amendment change sheet Lib 1B carry? Uh, the amendment is defeated. Like maybe. Uh, shall, <laughs> shall clause 66 carry? Carried. Carried. Shall clause 67 to 74 carry? Carried. Carried. Clause 75. I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth North. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, just wanted to get up again and and uh, and say that we'll be voting against this clause in the absence of being able to. Uh, move an amendment, can't move a negative amendment. So um, uh, this clause uh, also opens the door to nuclear energy. Um, and I did have a, a, like a pretty good conversation with the minister about the, these um, uh, clause 75 and 52 in, uh, in estimates. Um, but I still feel uh, like, you know, if nuclear energy is going to be talked about or discussed, we should be doing it. Uh, not at the back of a gigantic <laughs> bill on, um, on, you know, which, which is an important bill on, on energy reform, but rather have a real discussion about it with real consultation here from Nova Scotians again. Um, and I think that, um, you know, if nuclear energy or uh, SMRs are, are uh, t t 10, 15 years away, then why don't we deal with it then? So uh, that is uh, why we're going to vote against Clause 75. Thanks. <laughs> Shall clause 75 carry? Carried. Carried. Shall clauses 76 to 78 carry? Carried. Carried. Clause 79. I recognize the honorable member for Fairview Clayton Park. Let's try this again, Mr. Chair. So once again, in, in the spirit of trying to strengthen this bill, um, I, I move page 17, clause 79, add the following subsection after subsection one. Um, to subsection 52D1 of chapter 380 as enacted by chapter 31 of the acts of 2015 and amended by chapter 27 of the acts of 2022 is further amended by adding and shall ensure that these status reports are made public after section 52A renumber some clauses two to four as three to five. So once again, this is taking the procurement process um, that has the ability to um, be mired and, and be done um, as alternate procurements or, or sole sourced or whatever the case may be and making sure that whatever procurement process is done and chosen for uh, a certain project is then made public. So this is again just about transparency, um, making sure that Nova Scotians are informed as to what's happening and why the decisions are being made. Um, and, and really, it's just to, again, strengthen the, the nature of this bill and keeping ratepayers and Nova Scotians front of mind. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. 
Thank you. Um, I just want to say a word about this, and, and I guess it would also um, apply to the last amendment that my uh, colleagues in the Liberal Party moved, which is uh, it's sort of strange times that we have to move amendments that guarantee like the most basic mm -hmm. transparency and accountability, and that notwithstanding that we have to do that, the government doesn't even consider them. <laughs> But uh, just you know, checks their email, does whatever they're doing. Um, it, it's uh, it's 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 odd, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I think it would not be overstating it to say that a lot of this legislative session has been a discussion around transparency, and the challenges, genuinely, of a government whose kind of stated goal is to go fast, um, with uh, maintaining the public trust and following the basic rules of accountability. Um, and so far, I would say that's a challenge that is becoming more and more apparent to the public every day. Uh, so, you know, I support this. I think as we move forward into new and uncharted ways of um, procuring our energy, um, new types of energy that will be procured, uh, new financial interests at play. Um, it's more important than ever, particularly in light of recent reports of the Auditor General, that we do that in a way that is responsible to Nova Scotians, um, that we do that in a way that is responsible in particular to the way that we spend Nova Scotians' money. Um, and so I guess I would say, you know, we support this amendment because it is, again, just the most basic sort of um, suggestion of transparency. Uh, and, you know, I would just say to my government colleagues, it, it is not unprecedented in this chamber to see uh, an amendment that makes sense and support it. <laughs> um, it is unprecedented in this session but not um, in this legislature. Uh, and I think there are many really common sense suggestions that are coming forward that aren't partisan, that aren't expressing an ideologically different view, uh, but that are trying to, um, in these pieces of legislation that are drafted so quickly, <laughs> with so little consultation, with so little notice, um, you know, certainly the government sees that they can amend things all day. Uh, we saw that today. Um, you know, I would just encourage the government to take a look at these because there is a little bit of an Achilles heel around transparency and accountability. And it's one that I think the opposition is pretty respectfully trying to point out. Um, and so for those reasons, we would support this amendment. Shall the man been, uh, recon, <laughs> recognize the honourable leader of the official opposition? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I, I, I just want to speak in favour of this and to the importance of it. Again, this recommendation comes from the government's own review that they paid for. This is about ensuring that the rule of law and proper due diligence and process is followed when we're talking about very what could potentially be very large scale. Um, public procurements, big multi-million dollar plus contracts, um, given out that impact uh, the taxpayers. This, this government, according to the Auditor General, you do not, no one in this chamber needs to take the opposition's word for it, according to the Auditor General, has not followed the defined rules and processes for procurement. Uh, there has been uh, an incredible amount of sole source contracts, the likes of which we probably have not seen since the 80s. Uh, again, I'll remind the members, a lot of changes were brought to the procurement process, along with changes to rules around patronage by Liberal governments in the Liberal government in the 90s, specifically because of this party's tendency to do this and uh, go beyond uh, the own rules that are, are set in place for, for all governments when it comes to this. The reason this is important, again, is to ensure that there is value for money with, with public investment. That is another issue that the Auditor General very clearly articulated in two of her most recent reports, is that the government not only did not follow the tendering rules and procedures, uh, meaning that they didn't go to competition, they didn't go to market to see who could offer the best deal 
for, again, hundreds of millions of dollars of government contracts. No attempt whatsoever to see any competitive bids. There's been sole source contracts dished out hand over fist to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. Not following the rules, not following the laws of the land here in Nova Scotia. Again, rules that were brought into place because of a previous Conservative government and their tendency to dish out money to friends and allies. Um, and unfortunately, we see that sort of activity happening again all too clearly with the current government, Mr. Chair. Uh, furthermore, it ensures that there's value for dollars. It ensures taxpayers are getting the best deal, the best bang for their buck. The auditor, and again, these are not my words. These have been flagged by an independent auditor general who is not partisan, who is not a member of the opposition, who has, who has written a scathing report about our party that the government seems to really care about when it's involving the Liberal Party, but anything to do with criticizing their own government or giving recommendations to their own government to improve transparency, accountability, and process and value for dollars that are spent, the government totally ignores it. But yet they're obsessed with one Auditor General's report and, and neglect to move forward on any recommendations from any other government, government uh, Auditor General report that impacts their government. Again, the Auditor General has pointed out the, the necessity for a clause like this in law. Because not only does the government not follow what's considered to be the best practice and seek competitive bids for, for large-scale tenders, um, in 100% of the time that the Auditor General looked at, I think, an uh, expense of over close to half a million dollars, half a billion, sorry, half a billion dollars, there was no demonstrated value for dollars or demonstrated need, not even a demonstrated need for this, <laughs> this money to go out the door. So when we're talking about energy reform and the massive amounts of money that are going to be required to change our energy grid, uh, to get us off of coal, to build a sustainable energy plan for the future, we are talking <laughs> hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars. And there is nothing in there to ensure that this government actually goes through competitive processes, that they don't just reward their, their friends and allies as they've done to date, or that they actually ensure that we're getting value for massive amounts of dollars that are inv in invested. And I'm sorry, but we, we can't just trust the government's word on this. That has been demonstrated very clearly. Again, don't take my word for it. Uh, I ask this House, all members, uh, Nova Scotians to read the Auditor General's reports related to over budget spending, uh, related to Hogan Court. Uh, her findings are very, very concerning. Government not following rules, handing out money without doing any due diligence, without even demonstrating uh, need for these hundreds of millions of dollars that go out. Um, and no guarantee that Nova Scotians are even getting anything close to what the best possible deal or outcomes are. And again, another very clear reason we need to look at bringing in a memo like this uh, is because while we're seeing this government spend literally billions of dollars outside of their own budgets that are passed, billions, we are not seeing returns for Nova Scotians. We are not seeing outcomes improve in health care. We are not seeing outcomes improve in our economy. We are not seeing uh, affordability get better. In fact, we are seeing the exact opposite. More people without a family doctor, worse outcomes in the health care system, poverty going up, food insecurity going up. And part of the reason is is because the government isn't demonstrating value for investment. They're spending, they're spending tons of money without demonstrating need in many cases, according to the Auditor General, and, and, and it related to sums of hundreds of millions of dollars. And we have the very real risk that that's going to happen again. <laughs> We've got a Premier that's out saying we are going to be a hydrogen powerhouse. Repeated that today three times. We don't even know what, what that means. We don't know what the, what the concept is. We don't know how hydrogen is going to impact our energy grid here. By all accounts to date, it seems like it's going to be exported. Um, and the government, if they don't pass this, we don't even know if they're going to follow any competitive uh, process to actually hand out hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, to potential hydrogen players or offshore wind. 
You know, these are these we're talking about or nuclear. You know, these are the three things the government has talked about, and 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 there's no guarantees that it's not going to be personal friends of the premier. Uh, or allies or fundraisers that are going to receive this. And again, this is about ensuring that that doesn't happen. This is about ensuring that the rules of the land, the laws that have been in place since the 80s and the, the turmoil that happened in there as a result of a Conservative government uh, isn't, uh, doesn't happen again here. We've made so much progress in this province when it comes to spending taxpayers' money, we've made so much progress in improving our rules, our procurement processes. Uh, it's not perfect, but at the very least, taxpayers have been protected from corruption and from uh, using taxpayers' dollars to benefit parties and, and, and not the people of the province. And I really think it's imperative if the government cares about these things, if they care about value for dollars, if they care about process, if they care about competitiveness, if they care about getting the best deal for Nova Scotians that they, they pass this amendment. Um, and I think if there's any other reason that's needed here or arguments against this, any member just needs to look at the Auditor General reports and they will see how important this, this amendment is. Thank you. Shall amendment lib two carry? The amendment is defeated. Um, Clause 79. Shall Clause 79 carry? Carried. Cla carried. Clauses 80 to 87. Shall they carry? Carried. Carried. Clause 88. I recognize the uh, honourable member for Dartmouth North. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I'd like to draw the uh, member's attention to change sheet um, NDP 2. And I'd like to move the following amendment. <clears throat> Page 19. Add the following clause after clause 88. 89, section 67 of chapter 380 is amended by adding immediately after subsection 2 the following subsection. 3, <clears throat> notwithstanding subsections 1 and 2, the Energy Board may create a program to address rate affordability for lower income residential customers with the goals of the program including A, no lower income residential customer paying more than 6% of the customer's household income on home energy. B, no lower income residential customer losing power due to an inability to pay tolls, rates, or charges. C, affordability payment, affordable payment plans for amounts in arrears. And D, lower income residential customers whose energy consumption exceeds 6% of their household income being offered options for deep retrofits and other measures to bring home energy costs below 6% of the household income. Renumber and adjust cross references accordingly. So, <clears throat> this is something we've been talking about for an awful long time, Mr. Chair, and not just us. <clears throat> the Affordable Energy Coalition has been doing work on energy affordability for years and years and years. Um, and in this time of uh, high inflation, high costs of everything going up, high interest rates, uh, we know that uh, people are, um, people's money is tight and people are having to make very hard decisions between paying their power bill, buying food for their family, paying their rent, et cetera. Car payments, mortgage payments, the list goes on and on and on. And uh, energy affordability, we also know, Mr. Chair, is uh, we in Nova Scotia have one of the highest rates in the entire country, and it's, um, uh, sorry, uh, highest rates of energy, not affordability, but rather energy poverty, uh, and uh, it's just going to get worse and worse. And when people can't afford to pay their bills, as I said, they make choices, uh, and then we see a steamrolling, snowballing, whatever you want to call it, effect, uh, where we have people... Um, facing eviction or power cutoffs and that kind of thing. So this, in this time, when we are opening up this bill, when we are blowing apart the way we regulate energy in Nova Scotia and putting it back together in a seemingly good way, sensible way, we need to account for this low, uh, low income affordability measure now when we're passing the bill. 
so that when this new uh, system operator and when the new regulator are, are, are um, put in place, that they have, it has, whatever they have, mandates to account for energy affordability. Um, <clears throat> One concern about the UARB that has been that that has been ongoing is that it lacks the regulatory mandate to allow low income power rates due to section 67 of the Public Utilities Act. And this has been pointed out many times on many occasions by energy poverty act activists and advocates, sorry. Our caucus has introduced this change before in amendments to previous legislation and then in our own bill in the spring of 2022. While low income rates may not be the recommended approach uh, later uh, taken to tackle energy poverty, it remains a real gap in the legislation. So we're not advocating for one funding scenario over another. There are lots of considerations to make for each, um, which um, <clears throat> per the Clean Energy Solutions Task Force report should be evaluated to find the best suited program for the needs of our province. And at this time, when the regulatory system is undergoing a massive transformation, as I said, we should address this gap. If not now, then when? I recognize the Honourable Member Fairview Clayton Park. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm um, happy to rise in support of this amendment, um, NDP two. Um, look. Uh, again, we're going we're gonna to hear the same things over and over again, but it's because it's important that we feel the need to repeat ourselves. Um, we are living in a time where people are struggling. Every single one of us knows that our constituents are struggling more now than ever. Uh, Low-income Nova Scotians at that are faced with uh, decisions that no one should ever make. You've heard me say it before, my colleague from Dartmouth North just said it. They're, they're making decisions on paying rent or making a car payment or buying groceries or paying their electricity bill. This, and, and it is a snowball effect. She said that perfectly, the member from Norm, uh, Dartmouth North, because if I can afford to live somewhere, but I have a job over here, I'm going to need to have a car. But I can't afford a car, so then I can't afford that rent because I can't lose my job. So th these are real these are real life issues that so many more people are facing. And we say these things not to criticize. We introduce amendments such as this one, not to criticize, but because it's not a criticism, it's a reality. It's a reality that so many Nova Scotians are facing. And it breaks my heart that we have the opportunity to make changes like this one and like subsequent amendments that I will introduce as we go on with this bill. And it's just looked over. It's our responsibility to protect these people. This is, this is why we're elected. This, is, this isn't just something to stand up and talk about. This needs to be something that, a, a responsibility that we take seriously. And protecting the most vulnerable, as we move on, and, I'll, and I, to jump ahead to more amendments, uh, uh, protecting a, a larger customer base, people who are, are struggling every single day, I, I implore the government to consider this amendment seriously and support it along with my colleagues to the left. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to stand in support of this amendment uh, brought forward by the NDP. And the reason I'm supporting this, Mr. Chair, is because of the uh, many people in Cumberland North that are struggling right now to be able to pay their current power bills. Uh, I support uh, this amendment that government take a closer look at the need to support uh, those living in, in uh, having difficulty with poverty. And I want to point out, Mr. Speaker, that uh, this government do not seem to be uh, supporting those, uh, and this has been seen with their continued resistance to uh, not provide uh, an increase in income assistant rates um, again in this budget. And the people that were hurting the most, Mr. Speaker, a lot of the times are women, especially single moms. And this, uh, there is a, I'm calling on the government to, to take a look at this, to look at this pattern. We're seeing it in, in this bill, but we're seeing in other, uh, other bills as well and other decisions that this, this government is making. Uh, also, seniors are struggling in our area to pay their power bills as well uh, and put food on the table. And uh, for those, these reasons, Mr. Speaker, I support this amendment.
Uh, shall amendment NDP two? There has been a request for a recorded vote. The bells will ring until the whips are satisfied. Order of the Committee of the Whole House will come to order. I'll recognize the clerk to conduct a recorded vote. Brad Johns. No. Tori Rushton. No. Barbara Adams. No. Kim Maslin. No. Tim Houston. Alan McMaster. No. Twyla Gross. No. Michelle Thompson. No. John Lohr. No. Colton LeBlanc. No. Tim Hallman. No. Kent Smith. No. Dave Ritzy. No. Brian Wong. No. Susan Corkum Greek. No. Brian Comer. No. Brendan McGuire. No. Jill Balzer. No. Trevor Boudreau. No. Greg Moreau. No. Becky Druin. No. John White. No. Carla McFarland. John A. McDonald. No. Pat Dunn. No. Keith Bain. No. Chris Palmer. No. Melissa Sheehy Richard. No. Danielle Barkhouse. Tom Taggart. No. Larry Harrison. No. Steve Craig. No. Patricia Arab. Yes. Keith Irving. Tony Ince. Yes. Derek Mombercat. Yes. Zach Churchill. Yes. Kelly Regan. Yes. Ian Rankin. Yes. Claudia Chender. Yes. Susan LeBlanc. Yes. Kendra Coombs. Yes. Susie Hansen. Yes. Gary Burrell. Yes. Lisa Lachance. Yes. Rafa Di Costanzo. Ali Duale. Laura Lee Nichol. Yes. Ben Jessam. Hi. Braden Clark. Yes. Carmen Kerr. Ronnie LeBlanc. Yes. Fred Tilly. Elizabeth Smith McCrossan. Yes.
The results of the recorded vote are as follows, yeas 17, nays 29. The amendment is defeated. Shall Clause 88 carry? Carried. Carried. Clauses 89 to 95, shall they carry? Carried. Carried. Clause 96, I recognize the Honourable Leader, the official of the New Democratic Party. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to move uh, the amendment found at CWHB NDP 3. Um, page 20, Clause 96, Line 2, Delete Section and Substitute Sections. Page 20, Clause 96, Add immediately after the proposed Section 94, the following section. 95.1, where the Governor and Council directs a board or a board in its own motion decides the board shall appoint a person to act as a sustainability advocate in a hearing before the board. 2. A sustainability advocate appointed pursuant to subsection 1. A. Shall participate in all aspects of the hearing before the board and advocate for sustainability, environmental responsibility, and long-term economic well-being as a full intervener with power to enter into settlement agreements with other parties, and B. Has all the powers and authorities necessary to carry out the duties of a sustainability advocate pursuant to this section. Three, the board may fix fees and expenses of a sustainability advocate in performing the functions and duties of a sustainability advocate pursuant to this section. Four, the fees and expenses referred to in subsection 3A must be paid to the board by the applicant or applicants in such proportion as determined by the board. And B, may include the cost of retaining experts and legal counsel to provide the sustainability advocate with advice, including testimony on technical and legal matters. Five, the board may make rules respecting practice and procedure, scope of work, fees and expenses, and other matters respecting a sustainability advocate appointed pursuant to subsection one, and may establish a process for the sustainability advocate to obtain input from environmental groups when the board deems it appropriate. Six. The Governor and Council may make regulations respecting the qualifications and experience of a sustainability advocate, renumber and adjust cross-references accordingly. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Um, so this essentially is uh, an amendment that would introduce the position of sustainability advocate. This isn't the first time that this issue has been raised, um, and we think that it's incredibly important um, we note in this bill uh, that one mandate of the Energy Board, the new independent uh, regulator, is to allow consideration of climate goals and sustainability. <laughs> And we mark that as a positive move. It's one that our advocate, that advocates in our caucus have been calling on for for, for years. Um, and we heard the same thing at law amendments from environmental advocacy organizations like the Ecology Action Center and East Coast Environmental Law. But we also heard um, distinct disappointment that the legislation doesn't actually enable the appointment of a sustainability advocate. And I'll pause to say that. You know, we hear a lot about the consumer advocate, like people who don't really understand energy regulation or anything else um, have heard the term consumer advocate because that is the person who advocates uh, on behalf of all of us consumers um, in rate hearings at the UARB. And I think that role will now be retained um, in the new body. Uh, the sustainability advocate would essentially do that, uh, Mr. Chair, for our children. Yeah. So, so we would have someone actually arguing for the long-term sustainability of our energy supply. Because although we have progressive legislation and we have targets, we now have an independent body, we actually still have um, no disincentive um, against poor decision-making, <laughs> frankly, <laughs> on the environmental front. Not legally um, and not persuasively. And so, you know, as I said, environmental organizations have been calling for this. Um, and I wanted to read a passage um, from East Coast Environmental Law uh, at Law Amendments. They provided this letter, and, and I can table it after. But they say that the reality is that the Energy Board will have a responsibility to take sustainable development and sustainable prosperity into account, and will presumably attempt to apply that lens to submissions by parties like Nova Scotia Power, the consumer advocate, the small business advocate, industry interveners, and other stakeholders participating in board proceedings. 
but it will actually be very difficult for the board to apply a sustainability lens unless parties to the proceedings are bringing relevant evidence and perspective forward for the board's consideration. The board has limited powers to act unilaterally to gather evidence and information that the parties to proceedings are not bringing forward themselves. It's the parties to a proceeding who bear the main responsibility to compile information, have expert reports prepared if necessary, and make affiants and other witnesses available for examination before the board. The board then works with the evidentiary record before it when applying the lenses it needs to apply to its decision making. That the board will need one or more parties to take responsibility for equipping the board to apply its sustainability mandate and in the absence of a designated advocate, the likelihood is that organizations like East Coast Environmental and the Ecology Action Center, and perhaps others, will seek to fill that role informally through intervention in the board proceedings. And I know all of that sounds really technical, but basically what they're saying is they won't have the information, the board will not likely have the information it needs to make decisions with a sustainability lens without a dedicated role. Mm -hmm. Because the board will rely on the parties to the proceedings, Nova Scotia Power, industry, uh, people who have a distinct financial motive uh, in whatever it is that they're bringing to the board, um, they will rely on them to provide the information necessary to evaluate whether or not um, our legislation, this government's legislation, in fact, um, in terms of environmental goals is actually being complied with or being met. And so, um, as I said, you know, we have a consumer advocate. Uh, we are reforming our, our energy system. We are happy to see that reform taking place. Um, and this government is moving. They're moving on decarbonizing our energy supply, as they must. Uh, but that's going to get harder and harder. And as the minister has said, and, and we've had lots of conversations, we've sort of done the easy part. Uh, we got to do the easy part when we uh, you know, did the first few big steps away from coal because coal is so dirty <laughs> and because it got us so far down the road relatively. But this is the hard part now. This is the difficult part. We're gonna have to now fight for every target that we have. And that's going to be contentious, and there's going to be lots of parties at play. And, and the two things that Nova Scotians tell us we need to be paying attention to are rates and affordability and sustainability. People want a Nova Scotia that their children can grow up in. I want a Nova Scotia that my children uh, can grow up in that, that looks a little bit like it looks today. Um, and, and sustainability in our energy supply is a huge piece of that. And so this is really an invitation to government um, to put their legislation where their words are and uh, ensure that sustainability actually is um, an integral part of this newly reformed energy process. Mm -hmm. And so I would invite everyone to vote for this amendment. And with those few words, I'll take my seat. Shall amendment NDP three carry? Oh, 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 back it up, sorry. I recognize the honorable member for uh, Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, this is certainly not an area of expertise for me, but everything that I know about, um, about this topic um, would uh, point me in, in the direction to support this amendment proposed by the NDP. And it's certainly, when you look um, at our children and their children, I think there is an expectation of them, um, of us, to support these types of measures. And um, looking at being having a sustainability adv advocacy work um, through energy, I think through this department and through this bill uh, makes perfect sense. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Shall NDP3 carry? There's been a request for a recorded vote. The bells will ring until the whips are satisfied.
Order, order. I'll call the, the committee of the whole house on bills back to order and recognize the clerk to conduct a record of vote. Brad Johns. No. Tori Rushton. No. Barbara Adams. No. Kim Masland. No. Tim Houston. Alan McMaster. No. Twyla Gross. No. Michelle Thompson. No. John Lohr. No. Colton LeBlanc. No. Tim Hallman. No. Kent Smith. No. Dave Ritzy. No. Brian Wong. No. Susan Corkum Greek. No. Brian Comer. No. Brendan McGuire. No. Jill Balzer. No. Trevor Boudreau. No. Greg Moreau. No. Becky Druid. No. John White. No. Carla McFarland. John A. McDonald. No. Pat Dunn. No. Keith Bain. No. Chris Palmer. No. Melissa Sheehy Richard. No. Danielle Barkhouse. Tom Taggart. No. Larry Harrison. No. Steve Craig. No. Patricia Arab. Yes. Keith Irving. Tony Ince. Derek Mamberkat. Yes. Zach Churchill. Yes. Kelly Regan. Yes. Ian Rankin. Yes. Claudia Chender. Yes. Susan LeBlanc. Yes. Kendra Coombs. Yes. Susie Hansen. Yes. Gary Burrell. Yes. Lisa Lachance. Yes. Rafa Di Costanzo. <coughs> Ali Duale. Laura Lee Nickel. Yes. Ben Jessup. Aye. Braden Clark. Yes. Carmen Kerr. Ronnie LeBlanc. Yes. Fred Tilly. Elizabeth Smith McCrossan. Yes. The results of the recorded vote are as follows, yeas 16, nays 29. The amendment is defeated. Shall clause 96 carry? Carried. Carried. Shall clauses 97 to 105 carry? Carried. Carried. Schedule A, clause 1 to 3 shall, of Schedule A carry? Carried. Carried. Clause 4 of Schedule A, I recognize the Honourable Member for Fairview, Clayton Perk. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I move page 23, Schedule A, Clause 4A, add one immediately after the section number, and B, add the following subsection. Two, the primary mandate of the Energy Board is to focus on the impact of its decisions on rate payers. So very simply, we are living in a time where people are struggling and they are searching for a lifeline. And enshrining in legislation that the objective of this Energy Board is to base its decisions on how their decision will impact rate payers is one that we can throw to them very easily. This is not anything overly complicated. It is making sure that the Energy Board is always focused on its decisions being cost effective for Nova Scotia rate payers. And that's simply what this, this amendment does. Shall amendment Lib 3 carry uh, request for recorded vote? Bells will ring. Whips are satisfied.
Order. Committee of the Whole House on bills will come to order. I recognize the clerk to conduct a roll call vote. Brad Johns. No. no. Tori Rushton. No. Barbara Adams. No. Kim Maslin. No. Tim Houston. Alan McMaster. No. Twyla Gross. No. Michelle Thompson. No. John Lohr. No. Colton LeBlanc. No. Tim Hallman. No. Kent Smith. No. Dave Ritzy. No. Brian Wong. No. Susan Corkum Greek. No. Brian Comer. No. Brendan McGuire. No. Jill Balzer. No. Trevor Boudreau. No. Greg Moreau. No. Becky Druin. No. John White. No. Carla McFarland. John A. McDonald. No. Pat Dunn. No. Keith Bain. No. Chris Palmer. No. Melissa Sheehy Richard. No. Danielle Barkhouse. Tom Taggart. No. Larry Harrison. No. Steve Craig. No. Patricia Arab. Yes. Keith Irving. Tony Ince. Derek Mombercast. Yes. Zach Churchill. Yes. Kelly Regan. Yes. Ian Rankin. Yes. Claudia Chender. Yes. Susan LeBlanc. Kendra Coons. Yes. Susie Hansen. Yes. Gary Burrell. Yes. Lisa Lachance. Yes. Rafa Di Costanzo. Ali Duale. Laura Lee Nickel. Yes. Ben Jessam. Yes. Braden Clark. Yes. Carmen Kerr. Ronnie LeBlanc. Yes. Fred Tilly. Elizabeth Smith McCrossin. Yes. The results of the recorded vote are as follows, yeas 15, nays 29. The amendment is defeated. Shall Clause 4 of Schedule A carry? Carried. Carried. Shall Clause 5 of Schedule A carry? Carried. Carried. Clause 6 of Schedule A. I recognize the Honourable Member Fairview, Clayton Park. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I move page 23, Schedule A, sub Clause 6. Uh, Subclause 6 2, line 2, add ensure that tariffs are set low enough that it is cost effective for new energy companies to provide energy resources in the province and after shall. So we have a piece of legislation here that in essentially opens up the grid to clean energy companies. One would argue that that piece of legislation already exists, but nonetheless, um, if we don't make sure that the board and that, the, that is, is creating the optimal conditions for these companies to come in, there's not going to be any incentive for them. So all we will have at the end of the day is a piece of legislation that allows clean energy to come in, but nothing that actually puts it into place. So this simply, um, this amendment simply makes it so that it isn't too expensive, so that we can have more than an enabling piece of legislation. It's, it's pretty straightforward and that's it. Shall amend, Amendment Lib 4 carry? Aye. The amendment is defeated. Uh, shall Clause 6, Schedule A carry? Carried. Carried. Shall the remaining clauses of Schedule A, Clauses 7 to 45, carry? Carried. Carried. Schedule B, shall Clauses 1 to 28 of Schedule B carry? Carried. Carried. Clause 29. I recognize the Honourable Member Fairview, Clayton Park. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. I guess this is try, try. So, 
Page 38, Schedule B, Clause 29, add the following subclause immediately after subclause 1. Uh, two, notwithstanding subsection one, the IESO may not recover from ratepayers the cost of purchasing assets from NSPI under a transfer order. So this is quite simply, we've seen this government already bail Nova Scotia Power out and the cost to the ratepayer, will, the, the cost of that will come back to the ratepayer. This amendment simply um, uh, enshrines the, the ability that any debt that the government takes on from the um, from the entity isn't passed on to the taxpayers in some way. It's again trying to be mindful of the struggles that rate papers are facing. We don't want we want this to be something that is beneficial. We want this legislation to be something that is beneficial to them, not something that then has a hidden cost somewhere down the line. So this is our last attempt at trying to make that happen. Shell Amendment Lib Five carry. Vote. There's been a request for a record of vote. Uh, the bells ring until the whips are satisfied.
order the committee of the house on bills to come back to order recognize the clerk to conduct a recorded vote brad johns no tori rushton no barbara adams no kim maslin no tim houston alan mcmaster no twyla gross no michelle thompson no john lord no colton leblanc no tim hallman no kent smith no dave ritzy no brian wong no susan corkum greek no brian comer no brendan mcguire no jill balzer no trevor boudreau no greg moreau no becky druid no john white no carla mcfarland john a mcdonald no pat dunn no keith bain no chris palmer no melissa sheehy richard no danielle barkhouse <coughs> tom taggart no larry harrison no steve craig no patricia arab yes keith irving tony ince Derek Mumberkett. Yes. Zach Churchill. Yes. Kelly Regan. Yes. Ian Rankin. Yes. Claudia Chender. Yes. Susan LeBlanc. Kendra Coombs. Yes. Susie Hansen. Yes. Gary Burrell. Yes. Lisa Lachance. Yes. Rafa Di Costanzo. Ali Duale. Laura Lee Nichol. Yes. Ben Jessup. Hi. Braden Clark. Yes. Carmen Kerr. Ronnie LeBlanc. Yes. Fred Tilly. Elizabeth Smith McCrossan. Yes. <coughs> The results of the recorded vote are as follows, yeas 15, nays 29. The amendment is defeated. Shall clause 29 of Schedule B carry? Carried. Carried. Shall the remaining clauses of Schedule B, clauses 30 to 106, carry? Carried. Carried. Shall the title carry? Carried. Shall carried. Shall the bill carry? Yes. The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I ask that you please rise and report progress on these bills. The motion carries. We'll now rise and report progress to the, on these bills.
Order. Uh, Chair of the Committee of the Whole House on Bills reports. I recognize the Clerk. That the Committee of the Whole House on Bills has met and considered the following bills. Uh, bill 407 with certain amendments and Bill 404, which was reported with certain amendments by the Law Amendments Committee to the Committee of the Whole House without further amendments. And the Chair has been instructed to recommend these bills to the favourable consideration of the House. Order that these bills do be read again a third time at a future date. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That concludes government business for the day. I move that the House do now rise to meet again on March 26 between the hours of 1 p.m. and 10 p.m. Following daily routine, government business will include Committee of the Whole House on Supply and Committee of the Whole House on Bills. Motion is that we do now rise to meet again on the 26th of March between the hours of 1 and 10 p.m. All those in favour of the motion, please signify by saying aye. aye. Contrary, minded nay. That motion carries. We stand adjourned until tomorrow. Thank you.